Hello and welcome to another episode of America Unveil. Today we are in Woodland, Georgia, home of Old South Farm Museum and Ag Learning Center. Let's go visit with Mr. Bullock, the proprietor. Mr. Paul Bullock, you're the proprietor of the Old South Farm Museum and Ag Center, wow. and I appreciate you letting us come in and sure. see everything today. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started here? Well, I was a county extension agent for 30 years, and I started mm -hmm. in Bibb County, and then I went to Carroll County, and then ended up in Talbot County. And when I got here, um, they were still picking cotton by hand. That's mm -hmm. hard to believe, isn't it? Right. Then I grew up on a dairy farm, and also uh, we had a cattle farm, and then we did fermented pepper, and we had corn and, and, and uh, soybeans, and and uh, also my daddy was in the logging business, and, and I decided, well, you know, uh, I had a lot of old stuff, but I was really interested in peaches because we had a peach farm. Right. And I started collecting peach stuff back in the 70s and 80s, and then when I retired, the, these buildings here became available, and I said, this will be a good place to teach kids, you know, learning center. And uh, we've had as many as uh, uh, 25, 30,000 kids come through the wow, center. Wow, that's a and lot of kids. Yeah, in about 20 years. Now, what year did you start I this? I bought these buildings in 93, but really 96 was the first kids to come through. Mm -hmm. And since then, I've uh, had a lot of children come through, and uh, they've enjoyed it. And I'm, I'm, the kids come in, and... We talk about cotton and corn and peanuts and, right. and peaches and the beef animals, dairy animals, and that's what the museum's about. We have all these um, things that kids don't know about. The first question I ask them is, that, where does your food come from? And most of them say from the grocery store. But <laughs> right. we have to tell them that, you know, the farmers uh, produce the food and fiber, and the, and, uh, and when they leave here, they have a better understanding Absolutely. Uh, I grew up as a 4-H club member, but then I was in the FFA. But then I learned a lot of things in there, and then I'm trying to relate to the kids. They've done a lot of, they don't have 4-H. In a lot of the schools, they don't have uh, future uh, Farmers of American schools much anymore. So mm -hmm. we try to, that void they have, we try right. to teach them these things. That's what Yes, it's a rare thing today right. in the modern society right. to have any type of agricultural right education whatsoever right. and you not only you know was raised on a farm right. and was a farmer and a right. county extension agent right. uh, you're also a published author right and tell us a little bit about well the books you've I was interested in peaches right. and um, I've, I found some people that had done a, some work with the, the Roosevelt's little White House and written mm -hmm. a book he said why don't you write a book on peaches? I said, I don't know. But I said, I'm, I'm now working for the last 15 years as a, uh, with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, mm -hmm. and I do a lot of ag surveys, and I do, uh, do a lot of peach farms. And The ag I, surveys, that's a lot of statistical that's data. That's a lot of statistical data, and it's an uh, agriculture uh, uh, statistical service who I really work for, but mm -hmm. under the U.S. Department of Agriculture. But as I was going around, I saw these uh, peach farms, and they were doing away with the buildings, old peach packing sheds and things. I said, whoa, whoa. I said, we need to uh, write a book on peaches. And I've got a book, and it's called uh, The History, The Story of the Georgia Peach Farmer. Right. And uh, I went all the way back to 1880s when they uh, they come up with a couple of good varieties, and uh, that was Alberta and, uh, and, and the Georgia Bale. And... Uh, Two of these places had talked to the people that knew them and worked on the farms. And I said, wait a minute, I need to write a book on this. So mm -hmm. it took a couple of years, but uh, I did publish a book. Uh, that's great. The start of the Georgia Peach Farmer, right. Well, it's nice to find somebody that still has a, an enthusiasm and fervor mm -hmm. for anything agricultural and ag related because it's mm -hmm. so rare to find in Georgia right. anymore. Right. When I grew up, and I know when you grew up, it was predominant. Yeah. But now, uh, you don't find much at all. No, it's only about 3% of the people do still farm in the United States, so that's very little, but they're dedicated people, and I find them all the time. And uh, I started this museum, like I say, it really opened in 96, but I, I was collecting before then, really trying to find a place to have it, and these buildings became available, old furniture company. Mm -hmm. And we came in here and uh, brought all the stuff in, started collecting, and... Uh, 
Now, I've walked around. You've got an extensive and eclectic collection right. that dates over a hundred year right. span. Right. Now, in a few minutes, we're going to go around and see mm -hmm. some of it. But um, was it uh, an actual purpose that you had to have a, a, a broad span of right. agricultural right. machinery, or did it just happen in a haphazard manner? Well, I knew there was a ag museum down at Lumpkin. They moved that to Columbus now, Georgia. But they uh, they started from 1840 to uh, about 1880. Then uh, the Agarama in Tifton mm -hmm. ran from 1880 to about 1900. There's a void from 1900 to the present, mm -hmm. uh, to 1960, 70. So I tried to create that void mm -hmm. and find stuff that was still out there that farmers, a lot of them donated, and lot, I purchased a lot of stuff, but we would have a good museum. That's what mm -hmm. we uh, intended to do. All right, well, let's take a few minutes and look around this All museum, right. and let's start with what we got behind us. Tell us a little bit about exactly what this is. Well, the collection of barbed wire, uh, Mr. Ray Bale, who came to the museum, he says, well, I've got a collection of barbed wire here and I need to donate to the museum. And there are really 350 pieces of barbed wire dating from 1886, maybe 1870s, really. My, the collection here is 350 pieces. This is the largest collection east of the Mississippi River. And uh, we're lucky to have this uh, collection and uh, people come in here and spend hours just looking at the barbed wire. I didn't know it was, uh, there are 500 patent pieces and we have 350, that's unbelievable. All right, Mr. Bullock, these are interesting 200 pound fertilizer sacks. Tell us a little bit about those. Well, you know that back then, uh, that's how they bagged you out and fertilize. A lot of them were like 4, 8, 6, uh, 4, 12, 12. Uh, they went 200 pound bags and then uh, they had the poultry bags too and uh, we buy the poultry bags and and then flower sacks too had a design on them and I think hog shorts and stuff used to come in uh, right. two hundred pound bags. Right. You Anna. Yeah. You wouldn't you wouldn't find much more than a fifty pound bag you, these days. That's it, fifty or twenty five. Um, I know when I was growing up, mother always got the flower sacks and poultry sacks, and made dresses and and, and uh, skirts, blouses and, and bloomers. They made bloomers out of them. And this lady one time came in there and said she had them. A, a flower sack, and uh, and and then uh, she made bloomers, and right on the back, uh, uh, it, it had self rising. When the wind blow up, <laughs> people could see it said self rising. I saw that was kind of funny, but That's but funny. Uh, yeah, we collect all of them, and they made aprons. They got a whole collection of aprons over there that they made out of uh, uh, flower sacks. So that was real good, mm -hmm. and we've got a lot more to talk about. Sure. Okay, we'll move on then. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Bullock, tell us a little bit about what's uh, behind us here. Sure. So, all, this. Well, we got all kind of soft, sausage stuffers, uh, a, a, a grist meal to grind corn up for chickens or whatever. Uh, we, these three rows here back in here are uh, all small items that we use and uh, that people can enjoy. Uh, this is kind of strange here. This is for uh, uh, <coughs> shotgun shells. You can make your own shotgun shells and different kind of shots. That's the old thing there. Shotgun uh, shells. Yeah. Huh? They put the shot in there. Yeah, I can I can still see some of the shot some of the old shots in here. Right, and they make shotgun shells, you know, for birds or, or larger or game. Uh, right on down here, um, we got pots and grinders, and we got scales, and we got now. Uh, how, how old would this stuff be right that, here? That they were probably turn about 1900, probably in wow. the late 1800s, and these they were used way back. Uh, the soft sausage stuffers and. Uh, and we, we stuff a lot of sausage here, so that, that's right. what we use. Now they use the modern electric stuffers, but that was old hand stuffer we right, make sausage with, and uh, link sausage, so that, that's what they were used for. And right on down through here, we got a lot of um, uh, churns and pottery, um, just mm -hmm. uh, what they used a long time ago uh, with the churn they uh, uh, they could churn the um, milk. They let the milk sit and look like clab uh, clabber. It looks like jello, and they would churn <laughs> that, uh, you know, for several hours and uh, made buttermilk. Yeah, I grew and, up on a dairy farm. Well, I remember you know, doing all that. that. Yeah. So that that was real good. Uh, the the big uh, five gallons down there, they made moonshine and and uh, used them for various uh, uh, yeah. uh, sundries. We used to use them for soaps and stuff so, too. Yeah, right. Uh huh. And we we have a hog killing here once a year, and we might we do brunch stew, cracking skins, souse meat. 
and we do all of that. Now that's part of your ag learning center that, is the right. the hog killing right. as you call it. Right. And you do that every February. Right. Right. And we have anywhere from three to four hundred people show up, and they really come out and they take the meat and cure, uh, show them how to cure it. Mm -hmm. They take it back home and cure it, and, uh, and then they bring it back next year. And a uh, long time ago, we we cured meats, and uh, it was called Ham and Egg Show. <laughs> and every community had one. I know in Merriweather County, my daddy would go up there and the, the, the prize ham, it'd go for two to three, four dollars a pound, and they'd bid on it. But uh, <laughs> I kind of grew up in Manchester, Georgia. We had a uh, um, exhibit up there. It was called a nigger exhibit. But what they did there, they brought all the eggs in, the hams and bacon and, and corn and, and watermelons and cantaloupes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they got prizes for that. So the first place I went was to the exhibit. My mother said, why don't you go to the amusement park? But I said, no, I want to see the exhibit. So I stayed in there a couple of hours. <laughs> and I loved to go in there. And uh, first place I went, every time I'd go to the fair. <laughs> and I showed animals there, most dairy cows, but you right. did the same thing probably. But I right. enjoyed that. I, I love that. And uh, I worked on a lot of fairs when I was growing up, one in Columbus, one in Macon, Georgia. Also, Manchester and Thomaston. Right. We'd have exhibits and uh, spotlight the county, so I enjoyed that. Wonderful. Sure, I really enjoyed it. We're going to look around some more then. Okay. Now, I had only begun talking with Paul Bullock and looking around just slightly inside the entrance of his vast collection of antiquities of a bygone past. And already, I was overwhelmed at the sheer volume of all the well-preserved items in his possession, spanning over a century of time and encompassing various aspects of both industry and life. Paul is a quiet, contemplative, and hearty individual with a fruitful working knowledge of an array of different rural and agricultural industries. And the comprehensive inner workings of each he expounds routinely and philosophically with a zest and a zeal rarely found in people these days. As we begin our journey, through his collection of well-preserved and functional artifacts. Let's keep in mind the overall mindset of an individual's fervor and relish for preserving not only things from his own lifetime, but things of an intrinsic value to an American way of life that has long since disappeared from our landscape. Mr. Bullock, what in the world is this here? Tell us a little bit about this. Okay, it's uh, a thrasher. They did wheat, oats, rye, uh, barley. Uh, the farms would cut the, the barley down to rye, oats, and what they would do, they would shock it, put it down the field, put five bundles, uh, four around and one on top, and they'd come back in about a week, let it dry out. Then they run it through the thrasher here. And when it went through the thrasher, the shaft come out the back, but they had a bag down there where they could get the oats, rye, and wheat. Mm -hmm. The wheat, they made bread, uh, case cookers uh, out of it. Uh, the barley, they might have used it for making beer and stuff, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, we got several of those, some of them metal. This is the old one here. It's probably the turn of the century, probably maybe 1890s, uh, 1900s. This is the wood one here, this is real old. But uh, several companies made these thrashers, and we're real proud to have this. Uh, Start of my collection, from Mr. R. H. Clark over at West Point. Mm -hmm. uh, he had collected these things. He he was a, a teacher that, for farmers from Auburn University. He'd go out and work with farmers. When he saw a piece of equipment, he said, uh, let me buy that or whatever. And then when he died, uh, was real bad, he called me up and says, come get all this stuff. And I bought a lot of it. But we got a lot of stuff, uh, thrashes and mm -hmm. rakes and hares and combines, and we'll show you that. What but year do you think this would be? About 1900. Yeah. 1900? Right, turn of the oh. century. We try to keep stuff in here from 1900 to about 1960, so yeah. it's real good. We got a lot more to see. You don't see anything nowadays with all these no. these belt pulleys on them? No, I know it. 
We ran one in the field up here. We had a field day, and we ran a thrasher. We cut off wheat, yeah. and then uh, then we ran through a thrasher and let people see how it worked. And that was real good. We had a, 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 a binder, a grain binder, where we cut it, pulled by mules, and then they were, it would bottle it, and then we'd come in after it uh, dried out, we'd run through thrasher. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. then. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, I just had a collection here. Uh, that kind of tells the history of American agriculture from 1776 to 1990. But uh, it tells all the evolution. Like 19, uh, 1862, they started the U.S. Department of Agriculture and also land-grant college. Uh, Georgia was the first land-grant college, University of Georgia. What they would do, the, the senators represented from that state, they had land out west that they hadn't developed yet. Uh, so they would take that money and bring it back and start a college agriculture. Uh, that was started at University of Georgia, land grant. That's how they call it, land grant. Um, Fort Valley State is uh, 1890, 1890. They started their land grant uh, uh, colleges at Fort Valley State College. But um, then later on, in 1887, they come up with the Hatch Act. They had all this uh, agriculture, but they didn't have research. so. They need to have some research so the farms could produce more uh, with the fertilizers and also have a, 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 they, the cattle too. Uh, in 18, 1908, there was an educational train that went through Georgia um, that uh, stopped at every depot they could. And they had one here in Tarleton, one in, in Newnan, and, and all these places. And the farms would come for a couple of days there and see the best cows that there, best hogs. Uh, how to produce more cotton and corn. So in, in 1911, they did it again. Several hundred, thousands of people, farmers throughout Georgia, learned a lot from that. So that was taking the college to the people. And the people could, couldn't go to Athens, but they could come to the depot in that community and see all the advancements, all the research that was available that they could use on the farm. So they used to have regional colleges? Yeah. Rather than just the It was state. a college going to the people, to the farmers. Wow. And they would come and spend a whole day there with the family, and they would teach them how to produce better hogs, how to best cows, dairy cows, how to grow more cotton, how to corn, peanuts. Now see, I had no idea about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. No. Your granddaddy might have attended that. We don't know. Maybe. I know my granddaddy talked about it, but I never did ask him that because I didn't know, know about it till later. But that was real, real something. Uh, a couple things here. I got a picture of Gene Talmadge, uh, uh, Governor of Georgia, and uh, the people on this building, he was on the Board of Education, so they, they made sure the people and the farmers of Georgia were heard. And that was great. Uh, we come on down here. Uh, a man let me have this, did TV repair back in the 50s. Uh, tubes like General Electric, uh, here's one RCA, and your televisions, Superior, um, if your TV went out, hopefully it wasn't a picture tube, but he would use tubes. We don't use them anymore. But that was the tubes, and he fixed the uh, TVs. And uh, I know my daddy one time said, now, son, if it's a, a 1952 bottle RCA, he said, it's a picture tube, it's going to be $75. And I don't have $75, so what we'll do, wait three months to get one. But thank goodness, it was just a small tube, it cost $2. So we got to watch Howdy Doody and Willow Willow and all those. So yeah. Thank goodness. $75. $75 for a picture tube back in, yeah. Baked a loaf of bread, you had to. You'd put a loaf of bread in here and uh, okay. you turn this wheel and it sliced it for you. One slice, two slices, three slices. So you didn't have to do it by hand. Yeah. That's interesting. That, that's real interesting now, yeah. I've it's a seen bread slicer. A bread slicer. I've never seen more. This is the one I've ever seen. But I'm sure there are more. Best thing since sliced yeah, bread. Best, yeah, have you heard that? Best thing since sliced bread. This is old baker's rack. Yeah, uh -huh. open that up. Yeah, you that's put where your you put your flour in, in here. And you turn the handle. Down just, underneath, you put your shift sifter. My, my grandmother had one of those when right. we were growing up. Right. She used it every every day. Oh, if you didn't use this hand thing, I'll be sure, man. Yeah. And you turn, put your flour in there, shift, yeah. shift it. That's, that's really you, what's at the bottom of this. Right. I made your biscuits and and uh, made all your bread or whatever, sure. Interesting. Uh, this is the hog oil here. Uh, you'd put burnt motor oil in here, and the hogs would come up, and it would turn, they'd rub the 
head around it and uh, get rid of lice and ticks and stuff like that. Uh, it just turned and uh, as they used it, uh, they would uh, rub up against it and that would keep the mange and the, and the lice off of it. Mr. Bullock, you don't see cotton much anymore either. No, uh, I work cotton fields and I, I have to pick cotton in the summer, but it's uh, for uh, research and right. I don't pick with 10 feet a row. But uh, yeah, we'll see some more cotton. But uh, these are um, cane meals. This is evaporator pan where they, when they take the syrup in the fall, like October, November, they would take the juice run down through there and it cook the syrup. It takes about two or three hours. This here strip the, the uh, cane. cane, yeah. And they would run that down and get all the leaves off of it. And then they have a stalk. And they would grind the stalks. So we'll see that down here. Uh, get the juice. And uh, they could do it in a, a, a big kettle over here, a evaporator pan. I used the evaporator pan. And that's the skim, the skim is off the top. Well, that big old cast iron kettle you got in the back looks like what we used to call hogs in. Yep, we do that too. But, but you, uh, and you know, you're making the sorghum. Right, syrup. the sorghum, syrup. It takes 10 gallons of uh, juice to make one gallon of uh, syrup. So it right. takes a lot of juice. So when you buy cane syrup or sorghum syrup, it takes a lot of juice to make that one uh, 10, 10 to one ratio. Mr. Bullock, we seem to be in the dairy section right here now. Explain a little bit to us what's going on here. Well, let me tell you one thing that's going on is, uh, I was raised on a dairy farm and mm -hmm. back then we put milk in bottles and uh, my job was to clean the bottles. I got one cent a bottle and mother got five cent, I think at school. But uh, she'd bring the milk in early that morning for the kids to have lunch uh -huh. and uh and they paid five cent a bottle for a half pint that's why the school kids got it this is about a half pint here but then we had uh we had a pint and then they had a quart right of course they took the uh we took to some of the people in the community and delivered on the doorsteps and they would uh when they need uh milk they put a note in there i need two quarts three quarts whatever mm -hmm. and then uh they paid it for it but they they put the money in the bottle and we take the bottles and Go home and clean them and then uh, and fill it with milk. Our dairy farm wasn't that big. We had just about 35 cows. Most of them were Holsteins, but we had right. Jerseys and Guernseys. And they, that was a, the dairy breeds of, of Brown Swift, Guernseys, of Jerseys, and some Shorthorns. You know, uh, Shorthorns, yeah. And uh, they, were, they were very popular back then, but the, the main cow was the uh, Holstein, Holsteins. So uh, we did this for a number of years, but uh, in 57, 1957, the state of Georgia said uh, the milk, the milk needed to be pasteurized, kill all bacteria. Also, uh, they homogenized it. They mixed up the butter fat in the milk. Now the Jerseys got a little more money, and they checked the butter fat. This is a cream separator here. Uh, you put milk in here. Cream came out one side, and uh, they take the cream and make uh, mm -hmm. butter and things like that. Yeah, the Jerseys always used to give more butter fat. Right. I know long ago the people that had they would have Holstein cows for the quantity, quantity. quantity. and then they would have a few Jersey cows in the herd to increase the yeah. butter fat because yeah. you got paid extra for right. the butter fat. Milk, whole milk has that 3.5 better right. um, butter. Um, Some Jerseys get up to like 4.2, right? Yeah, uh, almost 5% yeah. butter fat. Um, but they have 2%, 1%, and skim milk. Mm -hmm. That's what, and they got fortified milk with a lot of vitamins in it, so that's why they sell milk now. Right. So that's real important. I know I was down at Connect Stairs in Columbus, and uh, I asked him, they had uh, getting most of Mennonite dairy milk. But uh, there was one dairy up in Alabama that brought milk to Columbus, and uh, I, I said, well, how big a dairy was it? It had, only had 10 cows, but they were milking my hand. Right. I said, what? But uh, they finally got milkers in, and they could get more milk, and uh, save a lot of uh, labor too. <laughs> but uh, cream separators, uh, we had some that checked the butter fat up here, and uh, they paid about the butter fat too. So that was a back here. I know you can't see it, but uh, we cleaned the bottles and uh, something like this. But then they washed bottles back then. Uh, they uh, had a machine that would wash them, so you didn't have to do it by hand. Right. So that was real important too. And on over, we'll talk about the, uh, the machine that uh, bottled the milk. Okay. All right, Mr. Bullock, this is what you were talking about. Uh, this, this here, the milk would come in, and they would run it down and cool the milk down because it was hot. Mm -hmm. And the reason they cool it down, 
Uh, maybe the milk was uh, trying to get down to 75 or 60, 65, but not to freeze it. But uh, after they cooled it down, they ran it through this pipe here, down this uh, container here, stainless steel. Then this uh, bottle was uh, filled, this machine would fill the bottle up, put a cap on it. That saved a lot of labor. Then, uh, like I say, most people uh, bought mil milk in uh, quart sizes, four quarts to a gallon. Uh, now we buy gallon milks. That's what I usually buy. Uh -huh. But uh, back then it was uh, this. Uh, they still use machines to make butter, uh, but, uh, 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 butter milk. Right. But uh, they would take a, a machine over here and put it in, cool it down after cool it down, and put it in 10 gallon cans, and then uh, pour it in here, or uh, ran it in by machine. So that was really important. Uh, this machine saved a lot of labor, and that's what they was looking for. <laughs> several years ago, we had, a, had several shoe shops in Manchester where I grew up, Manchester, Georgia. One of the places I like to go to is uh, the shoe shop. I get wedges, put in my shoes, and half sole, whole sole. They charge two dollars for uh, half sole, maybe four dollars for whole sole. But we, we throw our shoes now. We don't have shoe shops left. <laughs> but um, he let me have all this stuff uh, that would uh, do the shoes. Uh, they had the sewing machines here, and they would do saddles and leather work and everything else. And so uh, shoe, shoes were real important. Um, everybody, every town had a shoe shop, but you can't find them anymore. His name is George Neesmith up here in Manchester, Georgia. Mr. George is still living. He started in 1939, and he quit in uh, about, nine, about 2010. And so uh, it's important and, uh, to show people about shoes. They throw them away, but they had shoes like that. Uh, you had shoe shine, uh, polish. They sold in little cans, and people polish shoes now. You can't find anybody to uh, even polish a shoe, uh, shoe now. No leather shoes left, hardly, so it's important. You go on a, sh a shoe place and they do size your shoes up. That's the width and the length. That's how they do your shoes, when they measure shoes to, to make sure. But uh, uh, everybody selling shoes has uh, a sizer. So that was important. I don't know if you know what this is. This is a, um, took boots off. They bring it up, put your boot in there, you could pull your uh, boots off. So that, that was a homemade thing there. But you put these in shoes uh, to stretch them so you could put your foot in there later. This is called a shoe horn. I still use mine. I stick it behind the back of my foot and then uh, I can slip my shoes on a lot good. But shoes were important. Uh, all kind of things to do shoes with. Uh, they made the leather, uh, cut the leather with it, something like this. Uh, they made shoes. Leather smith ran the leather through there. So that was important back then, uh, a shoe shop. And every town, like I said, uh, they would use shoe, uh, had shoe shop. And uh, they would do a half sole. And when I was growing up in the 50s, they uh, put wedges in shoes. And they'd keep that heel from wearing out. But, uh, had a pair of penny loafers. I was so proud of them. Uh, they used this wax to shine the shoes. They had ox blood. I, I said, Mother, ox blood, that's kind of bad. But they had black and brown and, and different colors to uh, shine your shoes. So that was really important to have a, a shoe sh shop in your, in your town. Mr. Bullock, what do we have here? What we have here is uh, a freezer locker. Okay. Every, every, town any size had a freezer locker. These, after World War II, they, they popped up everywhere. And uh, we had one in Manchester, mm -hmm. and I loved going there in the summertime because it was cold in here. Oh, right. Uh, what they do, they had an abattoir where they kill animals, hogs, and cows. Then after they kill them, they put the meat in a freezer locker that you'd rent test for about $3 a month. Uh -huh. People didn't have freezer, uh, freezers. Uh, a freezer back then cost you five, six hundred dollars so they couldn't afford them. Right. But here, $3 a month. Uh, these lower uh, containers, which held about 200 pounds of meat, uh, were about, uh, these were about $3 up here with two, 250 Mother said we could come a ladder and get up there, and she wouldn't rent one of these, but she'd rent that. Now I see the uh, salt box here, yeah. and, and the, it was typical for the time to right. do salt curing right. the meat and sugar curing yeah. the meat. Right. Uh, a lot of them had uh, curing, they cured hams and right. shoulders and, and uh, had salt, and the salt would, uh, they would use the salt and uh, to cure the meat, and it was usually attached to the locker. Right. Uh, some places they enjoyed to have a locker, freezer locker, 
They have a candy plant and a curing room. Right. And the state runs a few of them, like a Tacoa, they do that up there. Even now? Yeah, even now. There's only about 20 of these left in Georgia. Uh, nobody does any canning. So what's the purpose of still having them these days? Well, you got people that like to go there. Yeah. And uh, usually the uh, the lockers would close on Sundays, but the canning plants, they would stay open in the summertime. The VOAG teacher ran them mm -hmm. most of the time. They would open up on like Tuesday, uh, Thursday or Monday, Wednesday, and uh, the farmers would come in. And people had gardens and stuff like that would come in. It's nice that places like that still exist for yeah. antiquities of a bygone yeah. age, such as myself. Most of them in South Georgia. Yeah. This came out of Tacoa up there. Tacoma. Man, they were, they were building new plants. So uh, they had one in Thompson called the Thompson Freezer Locker. And the building's still there, but all in. But you get a key outside and to come in here and you can lock your own box up and uh, take the key with you take the key with you and then come back and whatever you want to go in there i like well, three dollars a month was cheaper than owning uh, a freezer right. and most people at that time probably didn't even have electricity they probably didn't have electricity that's right yeah so that was that was real convenient and the reason i went there in the summertime is real cold in there and my brother locked me in there one time and i was banging on the door and they finally let me out but <laughs> i enjoyed it i enjoyed it <laughs> That's good. <laughs> it looks like we're standing in the middle of a cannery here. That's correct. Uh, <clears throat> just about every rural high school in Georgia, a rural, rural school, had a cannery. One time there were 500 canneries in the state of Georgia. Um, even Tom County had four of them. Every school had a cannery. Years the VOAG teacher ran the cannery in the summertime uh, from, uh, say, June to about 1st of uh, September. Uh, what he did, he opened up on Monday, Wednesday, or uh, Tuesday, Thursday, let people come in and can. Now what they do, they bring the, the, the vegetables in or whatever, beans, tomatoes, squash, whatever. And they would wash them over here and then they put them in a can. He had a way to seal them uh, after they put them in here. We had a seal over here that would seal the cans. Then they would put them in. He would say, I'm going to do green beans right now. So he put them in this container. And then he tell everybody's gonna be, I'm gonna uh, can green beans. You put your initials on top so you know who it is. He said it's gonna take about 30 minutes. So you had to hang around. We did a lot of peaches, cause we had a lot of peaches. They put them in here, run them over into this uh, <clears throat> um, uh, counter, and they made them live 25 minutes, 30 minutes under pressure. You had a machine that would have steam pressure running here. And what that would do, <clears throat> was scanning the vegetables. And after you count, he would bring, bring them out on the table. You had a way to seal the can, and after you sealed them, uh, you were about through. Then you would take your uh, cans home, and all you had to pay for was the can itself. That was the service of the county or the school system. And how much was the can back uh, About then? two to three cents. Two to three cents. Yeah, that's all it was. So, well, you know, canning is probably the most, the greatest modern invention. Because before then, there was almost no way of, of keeping that's food. That's right. And uh, this mm. has saved people from going extinct, I believe, yeah. to a large degree. All through the wars, World War uh, One and Two, Korea, and all their wars, they had canned food that they gave to the uh, army. And also, uh, this is a cheap way of coming in and do it. And uh, people could do that. But we don't can much anymore. We freeze. Right. So. Is I still, uh, contrary to what most people say, I don't mind the taste of food in cans right. because I, I think preserving it in its own juices and stuff right. uh, adds to the flavor. And um, right. I love uh, just the idea of being able to preserve. <clears throat> being a stenching agent, 4 waitress will can the foods and put it in the fair. Right. What they did, they got money, a ribbon, and they could take that home with them and give them to the family or friends, and uh, they were so proud of that. Mr. Bullock, I made $20 on all my canned stuff. Right. I'm so proud of you, you got $20 you didn't have. And usually, when we can, we let the uh, home economics teacher help them with the can and show them how the proper way of doing it. Once that's sealed, that could, that could be in there for 20, 30, 50 years. Oh yeah. And still be good. The only problem with this, uh, especially in the beginning, it was very dangerous because of all the pressure right. that was involved in canning, right. Right. pressure canning, and then you have water bath canning and right. pressure canning right. depending upon the acidity. Am I right. correct? Right. Yeah. That's right. 
So we love canned tomatoes, canned peaches. Well, I just love the idea, yeah. even, even though it's modern, you know, it's 2018, I still love the idea of being able to eat something that's not in season. Right. That's right. Know? That's right. So we, in, <clears throat> well, I look forward to going to the canning plant. Man, I got going there and I had my mother peel peaches and we did the tomatoes and I love that. And the kids that uh, don't have the opportunity to do it anymore, the ones right. that do, they say, gosh, look here, I got something to give my people at uh, Christmas and Thanksgiving and I got money and I got cards and ribbons and boy, they, they enjoyed it. And they're proud of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, should be. Should be. I didn't show you this while ago, but this is a, a sealer. You would take the can, put the lid on it, put it in here, turn the handle, and that would seal the can. I'm kind of proud that the can's got too hot. <laughs> you pick them up with this. You didn't pick up with your hands. But I did want to say something about this. This is about 150 years old. They did milk a long time ago. They put ice in here, block ice and chip it up. Put the milk in here and let it run down the side here and cool the milk down. And that's how they got the milk cooled down so it wouldn't spoil. So that was a, that was an invention there 150 years ago. That's hard to believe for milk. Well, it looks like we're in an antique stove graveyard now. Yeah. Uh, oh, these are wood burning stoves. I grew up one of these and I finally got an electric stove, but uh, this is a water bath. Yeah, if you got the wood in there, got it heat, you can heat your water up. That was a great invention. <laughs> uh, you put your wood in here and uh, then uh, get the temperature. I was watching the Walters one night. They were cooking with a wood stove and you had a, uh, you bake your goods down there. Some of them had to keep the uh, cornbread or whatever warm up there, had warmers above there. Uh, there was Southern Bell, Home Comfort, a lot of them, Atlantic. Uh, these big stoves in the back, uh, they were the elite. Uh, they they charged two or three thousand dollars them. That was in a big. That's what you saw in the rich folks' houses. That's rich folks' houses. The plantation the houses. houses. Yeah, plantations. Didn't have many of them, but we grew up on a just old wood stove, and uh, that's what we used back then. Then later on, we got electric stoves. Right. These are absolutely gorgeous. They are, they're really works of art. They are. Yeah. Everybody had a wood stove. Back All then. cast iron. Yeah. And that little, having to saw that little stove wood up about 12 about inches, right. 8 to 12 inches yeah. long. I remember that when I was I was talking that firewood in, I remember that. Yeah. And we're sharing our milk in there too, around the fire. It, it right. Fun sitting there. Right. Grandmother would. Uh, I can see her now churning. it. <laughs> so these are real good. Yeah. All these uh, wood heaters in here, uh, they use coal and wood heaters. When I grew up, I, I went to a four-room schoolhouse and they had a big wood stove out there, something similar to that, a little bigger. But uh, they use those uh, to heat up schoolhouses. And uh, uh, even one back here on Franklin Roosevelt had one in a little white house. This came out here, but they sold it, and uh, I got a hold of it. Uh, over here was one on the back of caboose, had a lip around it, and that lip, uh, you put a cup of coffee on that one, slide off when the train was going down the road you know, with the caboose. But they had all kinds of stoves here. Some for the living room, some for the dining room, some uh, kerosene stoves, uh, wood stoves, schoolhouse stoves. And uh, that's why you grew up and you had to bring the firewood in. And we still use stoves today, so stoves, uh, wood stoves are still important. There's gas stoves in here and the electricity came along. We even have a wood electric stove back here, which is unusual, which came out in the, uh, like 1948, 49, and later on, uh, it had electricity on one side and, and wood on the other. A lot of people scared electricity, so they didn't know much about it, and they were, but they, they still cooked on the wood side a lot of times and didn't use them. The kerosene, you buy the kerosene, this stove here was used about 10 years ago, man was still using it. And he, he died and left it to me, and uh, he was still cooking on uh, 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 electric uh, 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 kerosene. Uh, you put your kerosene in here and light it down here. Um, you couldn't put gas in it because it's real explosive, but kerosene wasn't. That's a commercial uh, gas stove over here. You cook uh, 
in a restaurant or something like that, a big house, and they use that a lot of time. But a lot of electricity, a lot of gas, um, the chambers here, uh, say a rail on TV uses that uh, chamber stove. She said it's one of the best ones. You had to have uh, $800,000 to buy it. But uh, uh, that was the Cadillac back then, but uh, nobody had a, a, a chamber stove. Which one is that? Uh, that one here, and it's one right behind me. This, that's a new model. Uh, that's all this one that Sarah Ray uh, used. Now, Mr. Bullock, this is some big equipment here. Explain to everyone what this well, is Well, uh, back then, they brought a sawmill out to your farm uh, where you're going to cut timber. And usually these are big, big logs, and uh, they had to have some way to move them to the little uh, peck of wood sawmills, they called them. But uh, I remember Tom Cannon, my daddy, told me one time, he said, you can stop your car and just uh, let your windows down, and you can hear a sawmill running. Maybe 40 to 50 sawmills at one time were cutting, but they would just cut a, a farmer's uh, track of timber. Uh, these big uh, pieces of equipment move the logs to the sawmill, then they would have a steam power to cut the wood up. And these were, were pulled by horses, right? Uh, well, yeah, uh, pergerons, uh, uh, oxen, uh, right. big mules or whatever, to move the sawmill. This is a sled here, smaller wood. It took a lot of muscle power to pull these oh, things, yeah, yeah. especially with logs on them. They could pull two or three logs at a time, though. And so, and so the, the logs would be suspended underneath. Right. Mm -hmm. You take that tongue and roll it back, mm -hmm. and then when you pull it forward, it, it'd keep the logs off the ground, and then the, the animals could pull it to the, to the mill. Right. So uh, that was one way of doing it. This, uh, um, like I said, uh, they move logs around and uh, at the sawmill, and we have two sawmills here, double off tricks. Right. Uh, both of them, but. Uh, that's an old can hook you're holding Can there. hook here. Yeah, they would grab the logs and roll them up. Uh, uh, to the uh, sawmill. Now, when when were these? Oh, uh, that was made in Macon, Georgia. Hard to believe, but uh, about 1900. About yeah. 1900. Mm -hmm. So these are 118 year old yeah. pieces of equipment. Right. They had oxen to move them and different things to move them with, right? So they were, that was important. People it hired a lot of people back then, and that was a good way of making a living. It obviously was. After the farmers <clears throat> gathered their oats, wheat, rye, and barley, they want, had the seed cleaned. They still had a shaft and stuff on them, so they bring them in here, put them in here, and the machine would turn them a hand equipment. But uh, the clipper made a lot of them, most of them, and that Aurora and different ones. Some were hand driven, some of them were, uh, but they cleaned the seed, and then they could plant the seed. Uh, they could use it for flour, make uh, wheat to make flour and everything else. So uh, cleaning the seeds were real important. So these were seed cleaners and uh, a lot of the farms had them on there. And uh, that was a good way of, uh, instead of taking them somewhere, they clean them. They could plant those seeds or they could uh, use them to uh, make biscuits or whatever with the wheat. So that was important, sure was. And these are from the 20s and 30s, right. correct? 20s and 30s, correct. A uh, mule-drawn subsoiler. Right. Tell us a little bit about this one. Uh, that's a big one. They subsoil the grounds after a uh, road to the ground uh, to break it up for planting, uh, getting roots and uh, rocks up with, so they have some cleared up land. Uh, and this would go two to three foot in the ground. Right. And this took several mule, It took several mules and horses, maybe four sometimes to pull them. And the ones around the side here you know, were scoops they would scoop dirt up and move it in. So that went important on the farm. So one guy said he built a whole dam with it for a lake. That's kind of hard to believe. Uh, but they would subsoil the roads uh, into the farm or wherever. Or uh, if they were planting peaches, that's what we had one for was planting peaches. Right. And uh, they would call them wheelies, these things to move dirt with, and subsoilers. And they were really important on the farm. So we were lucky to get these. Uh, yeah. And these from are all around 1910, 1920. 1910, 20, 30, right. Yeah. yeah. Solid iron. Solid iron. I don't know how they did it, but they did. And I don't see how the horses pulled them. Well, they you, could, you couldn't pull this with a 40-horsepower tractor nowadays, no, hardly. No, you couldn't. No, 
you'd have to. But four mules. Four used mules to be, could do it. Yeah, they could do it. Makes you wonder where they come across this horsepower rating, doesn't it? That that does, yeah. Horsepower. <laughs> Forty horses, thank you. It looks like you're standing in the middle of a lot of antiquated but very industrial strength scales. And these were scales that you used to use for weighing seeds and produce and different commodities, correct? Right. <clears throat> yeah, a lot of these scales, uh, they weighed uh, up to 200 pounds, some of them maybe up to five. Uh, like you say, if you farmer selling uh, potatoes or, or corn or whatever, he'd, he'd take these scales. Uh, this one up here weighed, uh, weighed vegetables or whatever at the supermarket, and you still see those. Uh, some of the scales are kind of unique, and they had them in stores, and uh, a lot of places. Uh, I've got one back here, it's called an Army Navy scale. Mm -hmm. And when you came aboard a ship or in the Army, in your duffel bag, you could only take 40 pounds. Oh. If you had over 40 pounds, you had to get rid of that stuff, get down to 40. Right. So uh, that's real unique. It's called an Army Navy scale. Right. <laughs> portable, all these are portable. But all of these were used for, for agricultural right, commodities. Right, commodities, right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sure did. Now, and they date from, some of these uh, date from the late 1800s. 1800s, to, yeah. And they moved produce on these carriers here too, so they were important. So they could uh, tell the farmers that uh, we're going to buy so many bushels of corn. Or, and I bet they're all still very accurate. Sure are. Combination things here, we got, uh, a lot of them had the ring washers back then, and the small ones, big ones. This is a homemade washer, so you'd wash the clothes in there. They came out of the Amish. They were hand washed up, and uh, uh, the round washers were Maytags, and the others were ringers. I know one time I got my sister's hand hung in a ring washer, and she started hollering, my mother screaming, and, uh, and I got a spanking for it, but that's okay. Uh, so that was really important. These old wash machines. Now we have the modern washers. So that was really important. This is an old buggy here. Yeah, this is a doctor's buggy. The doctors just come out to your house. They don't know. Them. But you call them up and they get in the buggy, come out there and tell them. There's one horse buggy and he, he tell old mule and a uh, horse and they come out to your house and doctor on you. And when I was growing up, the doctors would come out, but they had a car then. But my mother said they'd come out in the buggy. And my granddad was a mail carrier. He had a buggy similar to this, and he had to deliver like uh, 200 uh, a mail ride from 1905 to 1930. And this would be about from, what, 1885 to uh, 1910? Yeah. And they would uh, uh, deliver mail or come out, uh, use it for right. uh, doctors and anybody. Oh, go to town in them or whatever, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah, that was a whip to hit the horse. <laughs> he get them out there. So they were real important back then. Now you got a lot of single well, trees of and double trees. And, and triple and trees. Sometimes you had three. Uh, there's a lot of single trees going around a horse. Um, you had to get hames, uh, catch a horse's neck. You could... Uh, move your horse around, you know, plowing, or, or you could pull a, a horse could be used to pull a, a wagon or a plow or whatever. So you, your trees down here, they have a single tree, a double tree, and a triple tree. One horse, two horses, three horses. So they were important to uh, old cattle uh, to, to get rid of flies and things on the cows. So we put kerosene or whatever in there. So they were important too, so we use a lot of this stuff. We got a lot of kerosene oil cans. Farmers uh, started fires with them. They cook with a, uh, kerosene. We, we talked about that. Uh, you go up and, and you turn this and get your kerosene. You pay 30 to 40 cents uh, for half a gallon, a gallon. And uh, they use these to, uh, every filling station had one. Uh, every general store had a kerosene. And they use them to grease the cars with or whatever, wagons. So they were real important, so that, that was important. Uh, there was a double one down there, switched from kerosene to, to maybe diesel or something. So they were important. What's that you're sitting on? This here is a, uh, 
a road grader, where they would grade the roads or driveways or whatever, and uh, usually a horse or mule, or, and then later on uh, a tractor would pull it, or a caterpillar or something like that, but they would grade the roads. Uh, they would sit back here and uh, adjust the blades to for the curvature of the road, throw the a clean out a ditch, whatever. So they were real important. Over here to my left is a uh, manure spreader, John Deere manure spreader. This is the only piece of equipment John Deere wouldn't stand behind. You know why, don't you? Why is that? Because you get crap in your face. You stand, you stand behind it. So you didn't stand behind the John Deere manure spreader. <laughs> uh, this is for muzzle. Horse going through would eat corn when you was plowing or whatever. Uh, caught hogs with this. I've only found one of these uh, kill a chicken instead of wringing the neck or cutting the head off. They put the head in here and clamp down and kill a chicken with this. That's kind of unusual. And uh, a bunch here to uh, bore into a wooden uh, barrel to uh, put a cork in there later. So that was important. And we kind of mentioned these uh, keep the baby calf from uh, sucking his mother. But he could eat grass, but he'd come up and end up with a the calf couldn't suck his mother. You're trying to wean the calf away from the mother. So that was, that was important. And uh, this is kind of unusual. This thing here was kind of new, a horse and a, and a clam. They outlawed these because it was hurting the horse. He made the side that said no. They took these away and uh, they quit using metal horse collars. So that, that was uh, something that somebody came up with the idea and they said no more of that stuff. Long time ago, I can't even pick this up, but if you had a horse or mule and couldn't find a hitching post, you would use this with a leather strap and put it down, and that would keep the horse from moving so much. We mentioned uh, branding cows, these branders here, uh, brandy cows, also uh, these here, uh, put them in the ear. We would use these for that and uh, put an uh, identification tag on the animal so they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't uh, do that. Uh, old fire poke or something that things hot, you would use this to uh, pick up the hot coals or whatever and uh, get the coals out of the fire or whatever. So that was something they used a long time. So these, all these things are important and we're trying to show them to the uh, kids and adults. And this looks like to be a, a 1948, 49 Alice Chalmers G. G. That's right. I was always a big fan of Alice Chalmers tractors. We used to use them on the dairy farm yeah. where I grew up. This is uh, Alice Chalmers G. Usually vegetable growers or small gardeners or whatever use these tractors instead of the bigger tractors. And they were very popular. Uh, they only made these over in Anniston, Alabama for about five years. And uh, they're hard to find. And uh, I use them parades and stuff like that, but I ride around here and let my grandkids ride them or whatever. They're very popular with, with uh, dairy, uh, vegetable Vegetable farmers. growers, right. Yeah. Well, you got cabbage, collards, uh, uh, you know, uh, peppers, uh, tomatoes. Or whatever. They're very unique and very sought after. Right. Uh, they were kind of difficult to operate, weren't they? Right. They were, you had to know what you're doing. Uh, but they were, they were good little garden tractors and everybody one of the Alice Chambers uh, G, and they're hard to find, but but I'm lucky to get these two here. Yeah. And uh, glad to have them. They're in good condition. These pea thrashers back behind me here, uh, when the peas would get dry, they would take the peas and uh, and shell them. You had dry pinto beans and black-eyed peas and crowd of peas, and uh, they would use those. And uh, if you didn't, you had to take a sheet, throw the sheet up in the air, and, and let the, uh, let get the peas out of the way, but uh, they don't use them too much anymore. Some cotton baskets here. Uh, I mentioned cotton a while ago, and uh, I'm gonna show you a cotton gin and let you see how cotton is, uh, how they uh, take the lint out and keep the seed, and we'll talk about that, okay? We talked about uh, over here, we had corn shellers, and uh, there's even one corn sheller, or two here corn shellers, and old cotton baskets, and uh, this is another seed cleaner, Eureka, and it ran the uh, seed through there, oat, sweet rye, and barley and stuff. And sometimes they, they tried to get the shaft out of stuff here. They went back and forth and tried to clean the, uh, the peas and stuff before they cleaned them or whatever they were trying to clean seed to or whatever. So that was a, 
just a shaker. Uh, so uh, cotton, I mean, the seed cleaning is real important back here to the farmers. So. What is that you're standing in front of there? Uh, this is a peanut roaster. Uh, on every town uh, back then, they had, especially on uh, Saturdays, people walking in, they'd run these down the street there. Right. And they would uh, take the peanuts and put them in here and roast them. Uh, this one here, I had an electric one, and I also had one run by steam power, but they put the peanuts in. Yeah, yeah. steam power is roast. Well, they would come on and sell them in little bags. They would open up here and put the little bags in and sell them for a dime probably. And, uh, that looks in remarkable condition. It is. This what is, year was it made? Oh, uh, they were the 1890s, 1880s. 1890s. And they ran up to the 40s and 50s. And when I was a kid, they roasted peanuts on the street. First thing I said, Mother, I ain't a dime, go buy me some peanuts. And uh, right. they were roasted peanuts. So they would put them in here and uh, they would uh, take them out. and. Uh, they would move down a certain side of town with a lot of traffic. And uh, that guy could make some money roasting peanuts on Saturdays. So Those they were things real, are in for market They were long, yeah. Um, these are hard to find. I'm sure. Somebody in Kansas <clears throat> uh, reworks these, but uh, mm -hmm. they're hard to find. But I, I reworked this one here. That's an old one there. <clears throat> that was actually in Tarleton. But uh, yeah. this one here. Was in Dalton too, so they were really, really all good. the moving parts and everything still worked. Don't right. mm -hmm. It would probably start roasting. I don't know if we get a <clears throat> dime a bag, we'd probably have to get 50 cents a bag. <laughs> <laughs> Now this is some of the most interesting and unique uh, wood cutting equipment I've ever seen. Yeah. Like that massive <clears throat> saw over here. I've never seen a chainsaw that yeah. massive before. Yeah, my daddy had one and uh, <clears throat> it's a two man saw. I don't know who, uh, I, I would use the small end but they had somebody big on the other end but they cut large trees, anything from 24 inch to 30 inch. And, uh, then uh, all these chainsaws, well, over time we collect them, and they're, they're bow saws and, mm -hmm. and uh, straight line saws. But uh, uh, we even have a saw down here that uh, is a walking man saw, and uh, most of them now are bow saws. Right. And uh, we have one down there like it cut ice with, but uh, I think it cut ice. But <laughs> uh, Oh, I see that now. Yeah. This, this saws uh, had electric saw too, had that. And uh, one of them's a left-hand saw. Most of them are right-hand, but that saw right there yeah, is for right. left-hand people. And this has a wood splitter behind me. This uh, tall thing here. Right. Uh -huh. And now what, this was in a, a, a central for a community. Yeah, for community yeah. where they were coming. Right. Uh, say 20, 30 families would use it you know, right up the road here. And uh, man said, come get this thing. But it split uh, uh, two, two. Now, saw. how would it operate? Oh. Well, you're right. Well, Either steam engine or some tractor with a pulley. Right. But you would adjust that, cut your slabs. They'd be maybe 12 to 13, 14 inches. What you want to do is cut your slabs 10 to 12 inches, then split it every two inches. And this one here, a man would come in one day a week and uh, load his truck up and go to Columbus and sell uh, stove wood. Right. And uh, charge 10 cents. He'd go down the street there hauling. Stove wood sell and uh, so they can burn them in those stoves that yes, we saw a while ago. We saw a while, yeah, they can burn them in those stoves and uh, that was a that was a treat. Tom Houston started this wood split over here. That same people make Tom peanuts now. Right. He came to from Texas to Columbus and started the peanut company there. He couldn't uh, <clears throat> find anything to keep the peanuts uh, fresh, <clears throat> but somebody said there's a bag out now in 1926. Uh, a glycine bag, he put the peanuts in and keep them fresh. Right. He made millions of dollars doing that. 
you go buy a nickel bag of peanuts and a Coca Cola, boy, you you would have a treat then. That's right. <laughs> I uh, got nickel. Houston, uh, he came up with that idea, old Tom Houston. So, and he was from locally here. No, he that, no Tom was out of Texas, but he moved uh, to Columbus. Right. The reason he moved to Columbus, <clears throat> they had founders there that could make um, stuff like this. That's why he moved to Columbus okay. for the foundries, Golden Foundry. Uh, Southern Plow Company made stock and stuff. So it was a, that's the reason he moved there, right? Right. In Columbus, Georgia. Made a lot of money. I'm sure he did. Back here we have a grist mill. That was an old grist mill, but uh, they took a belt down here to run it. And uh, you could run a lot of corn there. You put your uh, shell corn up there, wheat. And run it through grist mill, and you could uh, you could have your you know ground up corn or grits, and uh, the only thing difference between corn and grits, corn's a little coarser, and uh, grits a little finer. But uh, this is a um, made concrete blocks. You put your paper down there, put concrete in there, and uh, after one day, it you could push it up, and your your block would come out. A lot of people build houses with these. They had some of them fancy. Um, they uh, a man built his house out of concrete blocks, but now they got a modern way of doing it. So that was a, all right. So uh, that was a concrete block maker made blocks. This here is a cabbage shredder. Oh, uh, you put your cabbage here, cabbage turn it, and they used that. Germans had these make sauerkraut, <clears throat> so they were important. That over there is a bone grinder. You put your bones in there, grind up, feed your chickens. Uh, just put that around your flowers and whatever. Bone, bone meal. meal. Bone meal's good. Okay, so that that was some good things. That was another grist meal back here, another grist meal. And uh, we're going to move on down this way. Uh, <clears throat> we're talking about corn. Yeah. We could be talking about wheat too. But uh, as you horn, corn, some of them mature in 105 days. Some of them mature in like... Uh, 120 days. So when it matures, uh, you're gonna get the moisture content down on these kernels, and then uh, they have a shuck on them. You take this shuck off. Every ear of corn has got even number of kernels around it. I, I'm not gonna count them, but get your ear sometime I can. But right. uh, you had to get the kernels off the uh, cob inside. And a lot of people just took their hands and, and, and knocked the corn off. But another way was running through this corn sheller. Yeah, and you could turn it, and it took the cob went one way, and the kernels went the other way. They take the kernels, and then they grind them down and make um, corn meal. Uh, you could make uh, grits out of this. You got white corn, you got the Indian corn, different colors, mm -hmm. and you got yellow corn. So uh, a lot of farmers would feed this to the uh, animals. Uh, that's what it's used most of the beef animals, dairy, horses, and mules. They use corn. Right. So corn is important. Been around millions of years. The Indians call this what? Maize. Maize. These are three cotton gins back here. Uh, in 1893, the greatest thing to help with cotton was uh, the way to take the cotton, the lint, away from the seed. The people would pick it on plantations, but they had to sit there and pull all the lint away from the seed. Now the seed they used for uh, oil, uh, we had an oil place in top at one time would take the oil. They use that for cooking. A lot of your uh, things to cook with cotton seed oil now. Um, the lint we make all our clothes with, our cotton clothes. But they had to have some way of doing it. Uh, Eli Whitney uh, invented the first cotton gin in 18, I mean 1793. Since then there have been a lot of them. But what's in there are blades that would uh, separate the lint from the seed. The seed would go one side, the lint would go on. Then the farm, they would take them out of gin and mash that together with a press. And we'll see a cotton bale over here in just a minute. But let me tell you about this. Back then, after they planted the cotton, sometimes they get too many uh, plants. They might uh, plant like 12 in a, a foot, but you want to get down to three or four. So we had a machine over here that would come back and cut out uh, that, if they didn't, they had to do it by hand. A chopper uh, um, had to come in there, uh, a hoe, they call, 
and hoe it out. That machine that had a foot on it would, would knock it down and leave four to five stalks per a foot. This seal was a bow weaver catcher. One thing did with the cotton back in 1912, came out of Louisiana up through Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. South Carolina was uh, the bow weevil. And once that bow weevil laid its eggs in the cotton ball, uh, it would destroy the cotton. So they were trying to kill it before it got in there. This is a prototype, a bow weevil catcher. Now what it would do, it would go through and knock the, uh, supposed to knock the bow weevils out down into a kerosene thing and kill them. It never worked. It knocked the cotton down there. That's why they called it a prototype. Uh, John Deere and none can make it. So uh, they don't, this bow we were catching this uh, hole over here was never used. Uh, we got machines now can plant them three to four foot. We got ways to spray the cotton now to get rid of the bow weevil. They have traps out there when they get too many bow weevils, they go out and spray the cotton. But they go check those traps and see if there's enough to spray, if there's no bow weevil. That's called a bow weevil eradication. They've tried to eradicate all the bow weevils. And they've done a real good job with it, so we're proud of that. If your camera could go around just a minute, I want to show you what a, a bale of cotton is. People have heard that all the life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn around here and let you see that. Y'all yeah, talking about the cotton gins. Loomis out of Columbus, Georgia made those. Uh, when they took the lint and they put it in a press and mashed it together, they make what they call a bale of cotton. I asked people how much is a bale of cotton weigh. You got some scales up there where we check the cotton. Most of them around 500 pounds, um, that cotton bale. But sometimes they went 550, sometimes 480 or whatever. But they were paid by the uh, weight uh, of cotton lint. I know uh, my granddaddy during the Depression, um, he was given five cents a pound. And that was a lot of it. A lot of times you pay the people picking them two cents or three cents, and you're getting five, so you're not making anything. Today, it's about 78 to 80 cents a pound. That's what to pay the farmers now. Back then, if you got a bale of cotton baker, you were a top-notch farmer. Today, they go over three, two to three uh, bales per acre. That means anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 pounds of lint, and that's good. So a farmer today can make about $1,000 on an acre of land, but he's got a lot of equipment out there. So uh, a lot of people are not in the cotton business. So uh, cotton is real important in Georgia. We have over, a bale of cotton. Yeah, we have over a million and a half acres of cotton in Georgia. Most of it is south of the fall line between Augusta, Macon, and Columbus. Most of the cotton grown that way. Now they got pickers can pick three to eight, ten acres per acre. Back then, a man could pick a hundred to two hundred uh, pounds of cotton a day. You pay two cents, he made two dollars. Working all day long. Yeah, we went down to the Sun Belt Expo last year, and they're putting them in round bales like hay right. now. Sure. But John Deere. That was the traditional belted yeah. bale of hay, of uh, cotton. Yeah, that's got hemp around it. Now, how much did that weigh? Five hundred pounds. Five hundred pounds. Right at it. And they paid a farm. And this was the scale that weighed it. Yeah. It could go up to about seven hundred fifty. Usually, uh, they they made five hundred pounds. So if Granddaddy back then. Uh, was getting five cents a pound. He wouldn't get but twenty five dollars for the bill. He couldn't stay in business no right. way. So uh, he got out cotton business, planting that tree, uh, laying in pine trees. How, how long would it take one man to pick a bale of cotton? All right, he pick a hundred and something. I've heard him picking two hundred pounds a day. Uh, wow, it'd take him a long time. Fam, it was a family affair. They had to stay out right. of school in September and October, and sometime November didn't go to go to school. So. Uh, I asked the kids, would well, y'all want to stay out of school and pick cotton or go to school? Most of them said, I want to stay out of school and pick cotton. They were, they don't know what they're talking about. No. I, I can't even pick a pound in a, a 15 minutes. It just takes Yeah, I mean, time. I'm old, but I, I wasn't old enough to, to have to have picked cotton, yeah. and I'm happy about that. You better be happy. I had to I had to do a lot of other things. Yeah. But, uh, I grew up on a pimento pepper. We had, you plant 5,000 pimento pepper plants per acre. And that's always due in, in September and October. 5,000 per acre. acre. And what did away with the pep, pepper plant in our area was uh, the deer. Mm -hmm. They brought the deer in 55. 
Oh, the yeah. deer loves pimento pepper. No, they love most things. Yeah. They they destroy a corn crop and yeah. what surprised me is they'll eat okra. Yeah. I didn't think that they would they eat okra. They love roses too. That's hard to believe. Yeah. Yeah, they love uh um But they destroy a okra crop, corn crop. Corn crop it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was out in the field. Uh the deer were eating corn, uh they were eating peanuts. Uh they said, Y'all plant it and they love peach trees. Really? Oh man. I saw peach trees one time from the woods up. They had cleaned out uh, the little trees out there. I've been planting four years. Right. They were two feet. As you got away from the woods, they got on up five, or six, seven feet. <laughs> well, what would they do? Eat the bark too? Or just they would the eat the top side of them when they right. were young and just wouldn't let the peach tree grow. So that was, uh, they put electric fences around. We went to a line and got lion dung, lion manure. But they, if you put human hair out there on them when they're little, a soap, some way that deteriorates them for a while. I, I heard that. I don't know if it works. <laughs> uh, we in the, uh, well, we in several things. There's a bobbish chair here. There's a shoe shine chair where they shine shoes. Every town had a bobby shop. And how could you tell? Red, white, and blue. Uh, that was a symbol outside there. Uh, the first bobbers had hand, they didn't have electric shavers or uh, cutters, but uh, my granddaddy was a blobber and a preacher and a bus driver, a bus, uh, school bus driver. But he cut my hair. I, mean, I guess that's why I ain't got no hair now. But um, hand clippers. And then while you're there, you get a shave. And if y'all remember those saying, a shave and a haircut, two bits. And that's what you get. You get a shave and a haircut for two, two bits. How much is two bits? 25 cents. That was pretty good. Now, what's that? I heard other day clippers called clippers. They wanted $10 just to trim your hair and if you got a full thing, they charge 15, but whatever. But the shoe shine boy, he had a rag, he'd pop them, and uh, you had leather shoes back then. And while you were waiting to get a haircut, you get a shoe shine. And uh, he had a rag, and he always said, Chattanooga shoe shine, pop the rag. Uh, some old cash registers around the wall here, some typewriters. Uh, every store, General Merchandise, had a cash register. And uh, when I opened up one of these one day, I found uh, money, metal uh, money, coins that were made before the uh, 20s and 30s. They had a mill town here, and they paid the script, and this was metal money. And they paid you, you had to shop at the commissary and, uh, and use that metal money. So that was real important then, is that came up. Uh, one of these cash trusts came out of bank, and they still got the receipts in there. It shows where they come in and, and uh, transacted uh, in Junction City, Georgia. I got in. Now this is a massive uh, uh, cash register here. Tell us about this. How old it is, and uh, just tell us that about it. That might be a little modern, but these metal cash registers. Um, that's probably 1920s and 30s. That, that's one that came out of a bank down at uh, Junction City, Georgia. And, Come out of a uh, bank. Yeah. The bank went under during the Depression. And you go to any little small town, there was a, a bank there. But that one, uh, that might have a roll of paper in that. Would it did. That. It has a roll right up here. Uh -huh. That would tell you. It looks like it's about 100 years old. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been. But probably when electricity came in, uh, uh, they used those. And uh, they were real important to uh, transact. Uh, was this electric? It looks manual, but it's electric. It, it might have a, it had a thing on the side that you could turn right there, yeah. That would run the paper through in, in, in uh, transactions. Yeah, that was uh, probably a manual, not electric, right. So they were real important. Every, every store had a cash register. Right. And uh, they made a lot of cash registers. <laughs> ice boxes. Uh, the ice man would come around, bring them a block of ice, and uh, I talked to one in Columbus. He still remembered when they had the mules and horses bringing ice around. And you you take a ice pick and knock off 10 cents, 20 cents, and you put the ice in here, a block of ice. They kept it about a week, and uh, they kept you uh, things cool. And uh, this one here had a water. Uh, you put water up there, and you could turn this out and get cold water. Not many of them had that. Uh, but uh, that kept all your eggs, your meat, 
uh, vegetables cool and uh, for about a week. And then he'd come around and said, how much ice you want? And uh, the ice man had a pick. And that ice pick would, he'd say, you want 10 cents. Uh, Daddy Columbus, um, I went down there and they had a uh, ice pick. And the man uh, said uh, they would go out and each house have a thing that said five, 20, 50. And I said, why'd y'all do that? Well, if they wasn't there, they would turn that card up and say, I want 20 pounds. And he'd go up there and uh, put the ice in for them and, and charge them, whatever it was. So they didn't have to be at home. So that was a great thing. Back there, they had uh, some more ice, electric uh, ice boxes, had the boat on top. We had a round ice box back there. They had a spigot down there, drank water that came out of a schoolhouse, and they drop a, a block in there. That to uh, keep the water cold for the kids. Then we you got, got a couple. To, you've got several of these things yeah. back here, ice boxes. Right. Singles, doubles. Right. And something that looks like deep freeze type. Yeah. You know, it's one over there that wasn't run on electricity. Uh, it was gas powered. I mean, it was uh, like in Vietnam, they had ice boxes uh, run on uh, gas, hmm. kerosene. And uh, they came out of what we call the Piney Woods down here. What do they have electricity up to about the fifties? Hell, I'm surprised you don't have one steam powered. <laughs> well, they could have been, but I, I don't have one of them. But uh, everybody had an ice box back in. Ooh, I saw that ice man coming, and I wanted a, a piece of ice, you know. Yeah. Ooh, it's nice. <laughs> now this looks like a lot of antiquated lawnmowers. Am I right? Right. The tillers and lawnmowers here. Uh, we got some. Unique lawn mowers, uh, gravely over here. We got the old push mowers. Right. We got uh, that's what I grew up with a push mower. I got tired of pushing. Mother, I said we need a, a gasoline powered lawn mower. They have some tillers here. Yeah, I see the one roto tiller. That's a roto tiller, but uh, snapper makes those now. But ro that's a 1931. 31. Yeah. Roto. It's got the serial number. It was about the 13th. Uh, um, Made. That's I mean, it looks it. like cast iron. It is cast iron. These one row, uh, there was a one row uh, tiller. Uh, these were Kincaid. Right. They made them. This is a snapping turtle lawnmower here, and I got one over there. And the reason they call them snapping turtle, the little turtle head is in front. Mm -hmm. And they made them uh, uh, well. You got all these manual ones here. I ain't got one. It's a flying lawnmower here. Flying lawnmower. It doesn't have any wheels. It, it hovers over the grass. And we were cutting grass out there one day in it. How does it hover? Uh, the blade turns and it comes up and uh, it just cuts the grass wherever you want to. But don't get, you might cut your foot, you know, you better watch it. <laughs> but I mean, it's what makes it hover off the ground? Well, that blade, and it's, it's around the side there, and it throws right. the gas out up there. I mean, the, the uh, trimming's out the side, but. Uh, Right. Most of them had a Gravely, a Kincaid. Uh, they, they, they were good lawnmowers. And then uh, some of them, uh, I got one out of Newton up there. You ever heard of Grantville? Oh, yeah, Grantville. That, that one that came out of Grantville. A man called me up and says, I got a lawnmower here. But uh, we've been collecting a lot of these. Uh, I mean, I've never seen as many vintage things. Yeah, a lot of, of them. all different industries right. together right. like you have here in right. this building. I grew up with this uh, push mower, but they had a gasoline powered uh, mower and th they started with this and the gasoline powered. Uh, Panther made uh, some lawn mowers. Right. Then I've got another building riding lawn mowers. We'll see some of them in a few minutes. But you got a massive amount of uh, just yeah, right. lawn mowers from right. You know, the 20s, 30s, 40s. Right. There were a lot of lawnmowers. They started in the 50s and 60s. Then the riding mowers came along. Right. Uh, well, that rototilly said was 31. Yeah, 1931. Yeah. That's hard to believe. Yeah. Mm. All right. Uh, <clears throat> this is our, uh, we, we collect a lot of uh, automotive. Uh, we got uh, battery chargers. 
We've got uh, jacks in here. A lot of jacks were made. Pick up wagons, or cars, railroad cars, whatever. But uh, uh, tire changers. Uh, we got oil, oil cans. We got a thing over here where they would uh, change your oil. Uh, you, if you buy the spark plug, they would change oil free. And the, but that what they would do with the spark plugs. Now we throw them away. But they had a sandblast that would clean those spark plugs for you. And uh, we've got a lot of uh, oil uh, connected stuff. Um, the oil cans, we don't have uh, metal oil cans now. We got uh, what we call, uh, they put them in uh, plastic now. So that was real important. Right. There's a thing on the wall up there. Oh, my ladies, when you carry your luggage, you didn't have a place to put the luggage. Right. So would you use that? So that, that was a. Uh, for the for the uh, automotive and tractors and stuff. Well, that jack back there looks like a vintage. I mean, right. what year is that jack from? Probably one of them. Uh, probably nineteen hundred. Yeah, that big jack over there picked up car. That picked up. I mean, car. like the lime green. Right. Jack. I, I mean, that had to be from what? Nineteen ten twenty. Nineteen ten. Yeah. Right. That battery charge of the white one back there. Uh, they don't use them now. They got little battery chargers. Mm -hmm. But if you go in a filling station back then, they would charge a battery, you know. And uh, they were big back then, so you know that. That uh, battery charges from the forties, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, forties and fifties, right? I remember Daddy going into a filling station. They used one of them. They rolled it out to the car. All them old grease guns too. Grease guns, bicycle pumps, air pumps, all kind of things in there. Tires. Uh, Back to oil cans, uh, drop cans. There's a double air pump back there. They're kind of uh, hard to find, but uh, they had all kind of air pumps. You didn't use an electric air pump back then. You know what you used? Hand. Hand. You sit and pumped it up right. <laughs> with your hand. A lot of people have never seen one of them. Right. And put oil in. You had a can. You dropped the can in there. It cut a hole in it, and you put it in with a spout. I remember we used to open them with can openers. Right, right. You know? Pull them in. Yeah. You put them in something like that. Uh, it had a spout thing that you'd hook. I think it's a spout thing. So you had to have an air hole and you'd stick that spout in it. Right. And then it would just pull. Pull in. That's right. Mm -hmm. That was that was unusual. Quake, Quake State made a lot of oil. I know that. A lot of oil. Still do, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was unusual. So everybody had a, they, uh, they had a way to get oil in cars. And tire changers, you know about the tire changers. I actually used one of these before. Yeah. We used to have that. If you didn't do it, you did it by hand. Right. And that, that thing was pretty good. I actually could could just about change them quicker by hand than I could use them yeah. on these. Yeah, but not the big tires. Not the big ones, not no. the tractor tires That's right. and stuff. That's right. Interesting. Well, these are pretty large grindstones here. Limestone grinders were every farm had one. They had a wheel. They could do. They could, uh, uh, you know, sharpen the plow stock, uh, the metal. Right. Uh, that one you got your hand on there was a. Uh, that was for axes and uh, maybe saw blades or something, but it was big. Run by a belt pulley. Run by a belt pulley. Uh, these came out of one store there in Tarleton. Some of them, and. Uh, I said, well, how do you know how to sell them? He said, well, you sell them by the weight. Right. So what if they weighed, they charge you for them. And I didn't know that until then. Uh, you know, so they sharpen uh, blades and knives and, and plow stocks. Okay, Mr. Bullock, what do we have here? This is kind of our water section. I've got some ice stuff in here. But uh, Well, oh, Bucky? Buck, yeah, I had a... I've got a well section up here that the kids draw water out of. Do you? Yeah, they got pumps and uh, uh, some of these are hand pumps. Uh, ice thing up there, crushed ice, that was a big deal. But most of the farmers had uh, hand drawn wells. They would dig down a 30 inch hole and go down until they hit water. Hope they hit it 30 to 40 feet. Right. But sometimes they had to go further now. Uh, these things here, the wood things around here, uh, they would dig, uh, well, they were called well diggers. Right. And they had a, a handle on each end, they would send a man down in the well that's got deeper. These, these ones with right. posts and the rope on them. Right. 
they would dig a well, and uh, you've heard of that coal as a well digger. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's oh, cold as a well digger's ass in Alaska. I think yeah. Phrase. I didn't want to say that. My wife would kill me. Uh, as they dug the wells, uh, they would send the dirt up and then they would dump it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they'd dig a little deep to hit water. And they, they said, Tally ho, we hit water. <laughs> but uh, those are pulleys on wells up there, across there. Uh, yeah. uh, those on the wall over there were called Alabama water buckets. Those metal things right there, uh -huh. water buckets. They dig a six inch well, send that down there, then they have two gallons of water, and they bring it up. Then you had a thing over there, would go down the well, and little cups on them, right there to you. Right. Right. Like they did. So you just send a cylinder down in the well, and right. it would bring up two gallons of water. Two gallons, call it Alabama water bucket. Right. But you had to set out a, a six inch water hole to go down in the, in the well. And these things just carried water. Mm -hmm. wow. We got a thing right down there where we turn it, go down the well, bring it up like the Egyptians used to use. Right. They would bring it up. You know, most of this stuff I've never even seen. Yeah. When, when, would, when would be the date span for the things uh, here? 1700s to, to uh, my granddaddy. That's his song. Uh, they call him Windless. Windless. Right. And he, uh, I got it off the well down there. A wooden wheelchair. My wife, mother was a registered nurse when I was growing up. Right. And she worked at the Warm Springs FDR Polio Foundation. Mm -hmm. 55, they came up with the salt vaccine. And uh, they still use that now. The state of Georgia runs it as a uh, well, care unit. Mm -hmm. But uh, she said Mr. Roosevelt was pushed around this wheelchair. Uh, so Franklin Delano Roosevelt was this was his wheelchair. That was his wheelchair, one of them. I'm surprised you got it in your museum and they don't have it in theirs. Well, I, I have called them about it, so. <laughs> uh, the water section up there where they draw water out, little pitcher pumps, we talked about that. Uh, uh, on around here, we'll, we'll talk about some washing machines and, uh, and we had a laundry baskets, but we'll talk about them. And uh, uh -huh. we have electric uh, ring of washer back here run by electric uh, gas. Well, what do we have here? Uh, we have an old uh, washing machine. They put the clothes in now, and the uh, soap, uh, lye soap, or whatever, and they would take it and uh, go back and forth. And that was a hard work. They would do that, oh, uh, maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then uh, take the clothes out. And, and then it rocked back and forth. Yeah, yeah, you could do that. They, uh, they wring out the water. Uh, later on, they got machines like this here that was uh, gas powered. And uh, they were lucky to get that as old Maytag. That says Maytag, yeah. yeah. And they would kick start it and run it with uh, uh, a gasoline motor. And uh, kick yeah. started. Yeah, they kick started. Yeah, kicked down like a motor scooter. And uh, that that was a real convenience. And you got one of them, you were uptown. Right. And uh, but these the Amish and people like that. Uh, they would put the clothes in there after they washed them before they hung them up on the line. And uh, this is the thing they could move around put the clothes in, hang them up on a, mm. a clothesline, and um, that, that was a good uh, thing to have too. And then you, later on you had ring of washers, then regular washing machines. So uh, washing machines have come a long way. Well, know. let's move down here and talk about some of these. These right. look interesting. We'll do that. Vistamatic. Pink. Right. The, uh, the square ones were Maytags, and then uh, later on they were more uh, ringer washers where they wash clothes, run through the ring up there, you turn it on, and it uh, would take the water out of them, and it'd hang them up. Right. But, uh, we got one back here that was used. It's a um, Kenmore, Sears made Kenmores. Right. And that was brand new in 1954. That uh, Kenmore uh, cost, guess how much? It cost $39 and a dollar to deliver it to the person. This so, Kenmore uh, back here. That Kenmore. They were round. They still make Kenmores and uh, whatever, but different size. Uh, but I, I'm saying to have a ring of washes, that was you uptown. I mean, 
<laughs> Not many people had them. And what year was that? That Kenmore was 54 back then. Yeah, These 54. were probably late 40s, early 50s into the 60s. Then they came out with better washers, and now they got, uh, we had eyes on the back porch. Right. Uh, mother wouldn't let us bring it in the house, but it made a lot of racket. And, she wouldn't uh, let you bring it in the house, why? No, 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 it was on the back porch. But uh, we were lucky to have one, and my sister got a hand in there, and I got whipped for that, but I know about that. <laughs> but uh, later on, they, they came up with better washers. Uh, they had washing machines, uh, they had better, uh, dishwashers, the old dishwasher back there. Uh, they came out, uh, that's a top loading dishwasher. Uh, that was about 55 or 60 probably. So they, they were real important too. And uh, we were glad to have a washing machine. I bet. She will uptown, man. We, I know people, they were jealous of us having a washing machine. You, you were part of the rich folks' society. I was moved up to the east side, right. <laughs> <laughs> What about this gigantic safe you have here? That safe uh, was uh, from the Excelsior building here, wood wool, and we'll show you something else out here. Wood. I don't have the combination. If anybody knows how to get in a safe, call me up. So you've never been in it? I, it might be something valuable in there, we don't know. So uh, if you know how to get in there, let me know. <laughs> I can't get in it. We could find some way to get in it. Yeah, might find some gold in there or something. Maybe. You never know. <clears throat> Everybody needs to save. <laughs> True. Well, what do we have here? Storm shelters? Uh, a storm pit. Storm yeah, pit. Every, every house had a storm pit or a cellar. And uh, what they did, this was supposed to be in the ground a little deeper, but my granddad had one, so I went up there and looked at his. And he stored milk in there, had all his vegetables in there. Uh, he had his milk in there, had a little stream going through his. and. Uh, he, and if a storm come up, like a tornado or a hurricane, but we have tornadoes, uh, everybody run to the storm pit till it was over. Right. Then we were safe. But, uh, you know, a lot of people <laughs> didn't have storm pits and they wouldn't, they end up wrong. I know it, it's bad. I'm but, uh, sure, well, they're not only useful in the past, they're probably gonna be useful in the future. Right, you got that right. The old dinner bell. <laughs> anyway, it looks like you got a smokehouse here. Is it full of hams and sugar cured and salt cured uh, meat? Right. We uh we take out meat when it's fresh. Usually I get our meat in, in December when the cold weather comes. What happens is uh, we cure them out for about six to eight weeks with right. salt. Sometimes I put salt peat on them and give them that red color. And uh, a sugar cured, or salt. most of this is salt cured. And what, I've got a bunch of hams in there now. And he asked me why it was locked up. Well, a lot of people want to get a ham. <laughs> I mean, is that from the hog killing you had right, last month? Right, it's hog killing. Uh, we built a smoke over here after we get the meat cured. We tried to take most of the moisture out. A long time ago, they would take out the, all the moisture. A ham or something like that will weigh, have about 30% uh, moisture. We tried to get down about 18 to 16%, right. maybe 14. After that salt uh, gets in there, cures that meat. That meat, uh, anytime you want to go in and get some out, it'd be cured. You just slice it, whatever. But uh, we built a fire to him using green hick uh, hickory. Right. And we smoke it for about two days. Sometimes they smoke it four or five days. Mm -hmm. But smoke gets in there, you have smoke uh, cured meat. Right. So uh, some of them may be in there uh, maybe a, a year or two and it's still good. Oh, yeah. Cool. See, they didn't have any way to refrigerate it. Uh, put it up so back then everybody had a smokehouse right uh, they would smoke to me and i got the idea a lot of them put the firebox inside the, on the waltons tv program mm -hmm. 
they had the fire box outside. Right. And we smoked it. And uh, we didn't actually smoke ours, but we did sugar cure and salt cure. Right. Right. So you didn't want smoked meat, but uh, well, I mean, we probably did, but we just didn't have the smokehouse. Yeah. But this is nice. Yeah. It's very. You build a fire. The fire comes in now, and the smoke comes out the top. It stays right. in now. Maybe uh, as long as you got a fire going, that smoke goes in there, and it'll. Uh, Really make that meat taste, taste good. I'm so sure. when you go in the store, it says smoked, cured meat, salt, cured, smoked meat. Right. So that's what you buy. Right. You could do turkeys. Um, you could do uh, hams, shoulders. And you know, sausage. unfortunately today, that liquid smoked stuff is is very prevalent, and it's a world of difference in the flavor between the the modern liquid smoke and yeah. the old fashioned wood smoke. Oh, that's about them. That's about them. I always use green hickory. For some reason, green hickory, boy, it gives it that good smoke taste. Woo! You I heard it. pecan wood is good too. Yeah, pecan. I've never used peach, but I know pecan. But right. but uh, preferred is uh, green hickory. It's more available. Right. So we use a lot of green hickory. So well, uh, really, smokehouse. Smoke Everybody house. needs a smokehouse. A privy. Yeah. Out house. A, a double seat preview. You know I started collecting them. I put in the paper and I got a lot of calls. You know back during the Depression, they made them. They sold them five dollars on concrete. I got one right down there. Yeah? Yeah. It's got uh, uh, CCC on right. 1934, something 36. Well, that's, that's interesting. That's a double, wow. That's a double. double. I haven't seen this many horse-drawn planters, plows, mold boards anywhere, ever. Do you have any clue how many you have here? Uh, I don't have a clue, but it's 60, 70, 80, about 80. Uh, yeah, they use these. Um, that's a massive amount. Uh, cotton planters, was a, they would click and make uh, blanch cotton to put your fertilizer out. Uh, they would uh, had cedars here, uh, plows to plow the uh, land with. Uh, I know my granddad had a bunch of these, and uh, we had drag hares, we had turn plows, uh, we had cedars. Uh, a lot of times they wasn't that good in putting out uh, seed, but uh, they did. They had some drag hares back here in the back, mm -hmm. and uh, those drag hares, they would uh, after they plowed the land up with mules and horses and oxen. There was a lot of horses it took to, to run pull up. all these uh, we had, plows and planters. Yeah, we had a white mule my granddaddy had, and uh, we had mules up to the 60s, but uh, I know granddaddy said he always had mules there, and uh, I know one of them had to bloat one day, and we took an ice pick and, and hit his stomach, and all this uh, hot air came out. But uh, he, uh, I got a white mule still up here. Right. And. Uh, and the man I got him from says, white mule, we call him Whitey. He said, now I guarantee you're going to have good luck with that white mule. That's been seven years ago. I don't know if I had good luck or not, but, <laughs> but uh, I still got that mule and uh, got two horses. But uh, I love these plows. Sometimes I find rags around the handles. That's hard to believe. Wow. You imagine plowing all day long one of these, and they put those rags on there to, to soften the uh, calluses and stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, it will tear your hands tear to your pieces, hands you know? And the end of the I mean, I've used these, but for planting, not with a horse drawn, I used it pull behind a little garden tractor, right. Right. and I would use the old ones from the, you know, turn of the century and, and stand behind it right. when I was a kid, and my father would pull me along behind one of those, uh, that G. Alice Chalmers, yeah, and I'd lay off rows of furrows right. in the garden, and then right. we'd go back and plant. And right. One of them clicks, as it clicks, that's letting you know that Every time it clicks, it's it dropping the seed. It's dropping the seed, you know. Right. So uh, no, that's a lot of manual work to this. A lot of manual work. And, yeah, uh, yeah, that was a, 
a chore to do one of these. Yep, and we got this thing right behind you here. Right. Now this is a small iron wheel heart par. Heart par. Tell us a little bit about, about the 19, heart par. Uh, these came in effect about 1915, 19, this is about 30. Uh, heart par, then Oliver took over heart par and they started calling them Oliver tractors and, and it's still uh, Oliver's. But this was a, had a pulley on the side they cut firewood or whatever. Yeah, well this pulley you would run those thrashers and right. everything that we saw in the other barn. Right. But they could uh, do a garden or whatever. Well, this, this was running at one time, and we'd go out and plow a little bit with it, but uh, we had to use it later. Well, this, this was the first tractor, well, the second. The first was steam, right. and then it went from steam to these small motor oh, tractors, right. which replaced the horse. Right. Yeah. We got a lot of the tractors we're going to look at in a minute, but this is a hard part later Oliver. So they. Uh, this is a wonderful, nice looking tractor. Right. This is an old farm mall. You don't often see them this age. No. Tell us a little bit about this farm mall. Back in the 40s, 40s or 50s. They, uh, this is an F-20 McCormick Dairy farm mall. Farm malls were around a long time. We had one on our farm and uh, they had rubber tires on later after World War II, but. Uh, but you hear a lot about the M's and the yeah. F's and. H's. H's. I got so But you don't. Uh, you don't hear much about the F-20s. I no, don't think I've ever seen one. Yeah. They had metal wheels until they started putting rubber right. in the late 30s. Then when World War II came along, they went back to the metal and uh, uh, because they were using a lot of rubber. Right, in, uh, for the war effort. For the war effort. So uh, we have a McCormick Deere. This is a farm mall, McCormick Deere farm mall. Then we have John Deere's cases. And uh, Okay, we'll walk around and look at some of them. So what is that contraption you're sitting on? But this was a uh, silo cutter. And they run the corn, green corn through here, and then chop it up with the cows. And a lot of them had, uh, so was this a, a belt driven belt silage? Driven, and you'd feed the corn stalks oh. with the ears on them. Right. And they would chop it and make silage. Right. You remember the silos way up in the air? Oh, I mean, we used to we used to cook uh, cut silage and yeah. uh, put it in pits and stuff. Yeah, well, they did pits. But yeah. I never used the belt driven ones. Ours was PTO driven right. later, you know, obviously my age. But this was, what was this around 1930? Yeah, 20s, 30s, 20s and 30s. And they, uh, they would get the corn and make sure it was not material. Them as they had the ear, small ears on them. Right. But you you didn't want to get one with too wet because it'd clog it up, but right. you'd wait till it'd get down about 25 or 30 percent. Then you'd run the corn through and uh, chop it up, and the cows loved it. They gave them more milk. Interesting. Uh, so that was a, uh, a lot of the uh, Mennonites I work with now, mm -hmm. they still use uh, silage cutters, but they're more modern. And right. they run them out in the field now and yeah. put it in a wagon, take it to the a pit, a silo. They still use silos. Right. I think this one is the oldest one I've ever actually seen right. in person. Yeah, yeah they, they, I've got three or four of them. Well, I see a bunch of anvils here. I see a blower, old blacksmith tools, it looks like. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about these. You in a hawk's calling vat, homemade. Right. And uh, that's where they scald them in, but they use barrels now, uh, metal barrels. They mm -hmm. don't seem like they work just as good. The anvils here, uh, every farm had an anvil in the blacksmith shop. This is a blower that could run the fire in, in, uh, in, into a, a thing and, and uh, heat the horseshoes or if they were making metal, uh, plastic, stuff like that. So th they run this blower around and it had the air in there. They kept the coals hot. They usually using some kind of coals uh, right. made out of coal. And uh, 
that we got a wheel right section in here too that would take the uh, the metal around the rim of the wooden wheel and uh, it would form the metal rim around there. So oh, really? that, that was real important too, yeah, to do that. And uh, a lot of, uh, like I say, every farm had a blacksmith shop and right. my granddad had three of them on his farm. And, uh, uh, they would work Actually, there. we didn't have a blacksmith shop, but our neighbor had one and we always used right. him for everything we needed. Yeah. But that, it's always, it's an integral part of a farm right. having a blacksmith These shop. These are different sizes. Uh, this big one here is 300 pounds and we had to tote that thing and put it on on a trailer, it was hard to get. 300 pound animal. Pound. They sell animals by the weight now. Right. If they weigh 100 pounds, you usually get uh, about $2 a pound. So right. this 300 pound would be right worth $600. That's a lot of money. Right. But, uh, but they, uh, like I say, wheel right stuff, and uh, they use that a lot. And uh, yeah. they, they were very important. Let's look around at some of this more. This is another massive pot you got here. You got all these smaller pots, and uh, you got even more larger pots. Yes, yeah. uh, we scald a hog and heat the water in this pot. Scald a hog in that vat over there, a 55 gallon drum. But uh, they made syrup in them. Uh, you could wash clothes in them. We didn't have that many clothes to wash the big ones. We used the small ones to wash our clothes in. Right. That made our crackling skins and. Uh, we got our, uh, uh, in the small pots, and on Saturday morning, mother get up and say, we're gonna kill some chickens, let's heat some water up. So when we got through that, we got to go to the movies, so I was glad to do that. And uh, she'd wring the neck of the chickens, we heat them in there and scald them and pick the feathers off of them, and then she'd take the- So you'd scald your hogs, scald your chickens, right, uh -huh. make your Brunswick stew. stew made Brunswick stew, and this one right here. Right. Uh, one of these. and. Uh, they had 40 gallons, 50 gallons, up to 80 gallons, usually. And that right. might have been 100. They're hard to find now. Usually they crack. Uh, um, nobody uses They're them. They're very large. They're large. And, uh, and very heavy. Yeah. Syrup making is what they use. Oh, right yeah. Now. Sorghum syrup. That syrup. would be wonderful syrup. For, yeah. for, for making yeah. sorghum syrup. Uh -huh. They're very, they very useful. Uh -huh. And this, tell us about this. A drill press. Uh, they could drill big holes and stuff. And, uh, we had a uh, wheel right stuff back here made the metal go around the uh, the wheels and stuff. That's right. Well, how did this? How did it? Just put it down and uh, put your bit in there. And, uh, right. You, but it was belt driven. Belt driven. Yeah. Oh yeah. It, it was, was a belt driven drill press. Drill press. Right. Mm -hmm. You get wood amazing. or metal. Right. That's amazing. That's amazing. That. Yeah. They. Uh, I have never seen one of these. You never seen one. Never seen one of these. <laughs> but uh, that's okay. Uh, we. This one we got. We've got a, a thrasher back here, but this piece of equipment here is a corn cutter. As they planted corn, they had two blades on the side. They would sit on this side, that side, and the mule would pull it, and it would cut the corn. Then you put it in a silage machine and make silage out of it. But uh, maybe in Iowa and down here we had a few of them, but uh, it was called a corn cutter. You cut a lot of corn, go down the road and cut uh, two rows at a time. You saw old wood uh, thrasher, this did wheat, oats, and rye and barley. But this is a thrasher here, they cut the wheat, bring it in here after it dried out. Um, they bring it here and thrash it out. You could, uh, the wheat make bread and all that. Then they make beer or whatever they did, but this is a, a thrasher. They had a grain binder, and then a thrasher, then they made a combine. These are combines. And this is? A combine. Combine. We talked about the thrasher. Right. But that, that we went did. out in the 20s and 30s. They came up with an idea with a grain binder. They could take the, the grain and bring it here after dried, and uh, uh, through the thrasher, this thing ran through the field. Mm -hmm. It cut the wheat, oats, rye, barley, and then it would uh, the wheels would turn, and the sheriff would come out the back, and the 
And, and this was the bench, I, I suppose, where someone would sit with the bag, bag. and the grain come out here and yeah. they would bag it, put the bag here and roll it roll off, on. am I correct? Right, and somebody would come along and pick it up. Right. And they would sell that as seed, or they could do it, or they'd have to take it up and uh, uh, through the uh, seed cleaner, but after right. that they could sell it. Take it to the clipper machine that we right. saw in the other building. That's right, we do that in the other building. Now we hadn't seen a grain binder or a coin binder, but I'm going to show you these right. in a while. Okay. So they but were this, whole, this whole row that we've got here. I got three of them right here. Or the combine. Combine. Yeah. All right, the combine did the uh, thrasher and the, uh, the, the uh, small uh, binder down there that would take it in a, they put them together and called it a combine. Mm -hmm. That was a, so that, that. How's was it combined? Right, combined. Right. Okay, we'll look at those. This seems like it never ends. You got one building after another building after another building. Yeah, uh, we're in the peach section now. I, I love peaches, and I grew up on a peach farm, and uh, it's not in session. The peaches come in June, July, and August, now in September a little bit. But uh, peaches are real important because Georgia's called the peach state. Right. And uh, they came about. But, uh, so all of this is peach related. Uh, related. I have a peach. equipment. Yeah, I built a peach shed like my granddaddy used to have, and uh, it's across the road. And, uh, they would bring the peaches in, dump them in a, a defuzz. The peaches got fuzz on. Right. And they got to take that fuzz off. So they had horse out brushes that would take the fuzz off of. They run them on down here and they size them. Peaches different sizes. Then they put them in. Used to put them in uh, flats. They had six uh, uh, cups in there. And they would sell them like that, but then later on they put them in uh, boxes uh, like this. Uh. What was the purpose or the reason why they had to take the fuzz off of them? Well, you didn't want to go to the store. A lot of people don't like fuzz. My little boy is kind of allergic to fuzz. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are, and they don't want to get fuzz on them. So then they come up with a hydro cooler way of doing it with water. Right. And uh, they dip them, in, and the brushes take off the fuzz. So that was a horse hat brush fuzzer. Then they used to pick them in boxes. They paid people like this to pick them in. Then first they came in uh, baskets, a half a bushel, three quarter bushel, a bushel. Uh, farmers now sell them by uh, three quarter bushel boxes. Right. And that's where they buy them in the store today. But uh, they had a way of, of uh, taking the peaches and they had a a ring it out there, they would ring them and turn them upside down. They'd fill the bottom and then they'd ring the top back in the 40s and 50s. <coughs> and then they sell them. <coughs> there were two package heads here at a rail side in here, they load them on here, taking the New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia up through there. Now tell us about this large wooden barrel you got. Oh, uh, that was on a farm where they get water. They had a windmill to pump the water at night, and then they get okay. up there, sprayers. Spread out. So that was basically for irrigation? Well, it was for uh, spraying peaches, apples, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And I got some sprayers down here I'll show you in a minute. All right. But uh, peaches are important in Georgia. Uh, the kids from Alabama coming in, I said, what is Alabama called? They said, we don't know. I said, it's called the redneck state. <laughs> but it's not. It's the state of Dixon. But Georgia is a peach state. And I wrote a book on peaches. Yeah. And I'm glad to share it with anybody. But it tells about the history of it. And uh, that, that, that's a real interesting story about peaches. There were two package years right here. That's kind of hard to believe. And they disappeared in the 60s, 70s. So peaches are really important. Great. <laughs> this is a, a mortise machine, 1863. In 1863, when well, they take the boards and mortise them together, and that was to make caskets in 1863. During the uh, Civil War, war between the states, the South lost 500,000 men. 
and then in a lot of caskets. So that machine was invented to make the caskets. And uh, that was a, that was quite a thing. It ran on a belt. It made them. And uh, as we move up here, this is a uh, corn binder. And you sit up here with mules in front, and, uh, and then you'd run through the field, cut your corn, stalks, corn, and everything. And then they would uh, go through here and tie them and bum them. They could make silage out of it mostly. And uh, this one, uh, well, you didn't have to go out there by hand and cut them. You could use this machine to do that with. So that was a, that was a great feat in itself. It's called a corn binder. Then they had a grain binder. We'll look at it in a minute. So a corn binder was important to the farmers. Oh, this is a grain binder. We talked about the thrasher that would thrash the wheat oats or rye barley, this here would cut it, pulled by mules mostly, and it would go around and cut it, and they would shock it, put it in five bundles, let it dry out. Then you take the grain, put it in the thrasher. But you combine a thrasher and a grain binder, and you got a combine. We talked about the combines a while ago. So the combine displaced the, uh, the thrasher in the grain binder. So uh, now they got, they, they got these big machines now, combines that can cut uh, 48 feet or 60 feet or whatever. They're mostly out west, but we do have them in Georgia 24 feet, so that's really important. We got a shingle mill over there, red cedar, and what they would do with it across here is cut the shingles and make shingles. The shingles were important because most of the houses had wood shingles. They didn't have tin <coughs> and uh, tar or shingles and things else. These are red cedar shingles, so they were important. The farmers in the wintertime didn't have an income coming in, so they made charcoal. Oak and hickory made charcoal. <coughs> they would take a, a way to, to cook the charcoal, or the wood, oak and hickory, and they would take that and the little pieces up, they got all the cinders out, and. Uh, they would put them in there and sell this, charcoal. So oak and hickory makes charcoal. These are five pound bags. They would sell them at Piggly Wiggly, Winn Dixie. So that was important to farmers have something to do in the wintertime, make charcoal. And what is this? A uh, stationary hay baler. A stationary hay baler. Stationary. Didn't go through the fields to bale hay. Uh, what we call a square bale. Right. <coughs> they weigh from 40 to 50 pounds. They bring the hay in, cost them, you know what it was, and run it through here. Run off a belt, a tractor, a pulley, right. and then ran through here and made a, come out the back down here and made a square belt. They had to tie it with either string or wire. Right. And so you, you'd load the, the, the loose hay from a, you, you'd cut it with a horse drawn sickle right. mower, you'd fork it onto the wagon, right. you'd bring the wagon in and bale it with this machine here. Yeah, you dump it off there into this machine. As you put more you put, it pushes that other bale out right. the back. And then when it came out, they could load it up, take it to the barns or whatever. So it was a convenience, just towing it to the barn and forking it up. I and mean, look at these massive cogs, pistons, right. and those very heavy springs. I mean, you're talking about compacting some hay. It would. Uh, I mean, this beats anything that they make these days. This, uh, John Deere, when I got this, a man said, uh, they were bailing hay one day and a man got his fingers caught. Those cogs took off two of his fingers. Wow. So you gotta be careful around this. Safety, safety there. is the most important thing on the farm. More farmers killed by machinery than anything else, so. 1930s, huh? Yeah. I got several hay bales. Yeah, let's take a look at some of them. Mm -hmm. Now this is a hay baler from the 1920s. Yeah. This uh, that, a lot of companies made them. John Deere, uh, E. Mattis Chandler's, uh, New Holland, uh, New Way. New. They had probably 20 kind of hay balers. I've got one of those hay press. Well, Mew walked around in press that they didn't have a machinery to run it with. Then later on, I've got a John Deere <coughs> with a motor out on it that was motorized. But you had to have a, a tractor or something with no power to take off 
and that uh, will go through with that motor and bail a square bail. <coughs> but it took a lot of power to turn this uh, this flywheel here. Yeah. This flywheel probably weighs 400 pounds. But uh, they don't use these anymore. No, no. Even had a hand bail here that they do pie straw and hay with now. People that pie straw bees use a hand baler. So they import it too. So uh, we see a lot of them around. You have several back through here. I got five or six, yeah. Wow. They're really they're impressive, yeah. Franklin Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt constituted a uh, program during the 30s, tree planting. But a lot of them had to do it by hand. But later on, they had a, a tractor to pull this uh, tree planter. They put the little pine uh, uh, seedlings in here. Man would sit back there and drop them. And it closed in like coulters. So they had these uh, tree planters. They had a transplant over there, we plant trees and also uh, tomatoes, tobacco, and stuff like that. So they were getting more modernized then. The tree planter was important. I know uh, in 1959, they uh, got his trees for $3 a thousand, little pine seedlings. And then we used a tree planter like this. You could plant maybe uh, a 500 trees per acre. They usually plant about 700 trees now, pine seedlings per acre. So a tree planter came in handy. If you didn't, you had to do it by hand. And that's a lot of labor intense, right? So they were real important. After the farmers would cut the hay, they would windrow it in some kind of form and try to pick it up. They used pitch force for that, carry it to the barn. This is a hay loader. It would come through here and pick the hay up and drop it on a wagon back there. This came out of Berry Schools in Rome, Georgia. This is a peanut picker. As the farmers grow the peanuts, uh, they'll, the peanuts grow below ground, it's a lagoon, and the vines grow above ground. They would dig these peanuts and put them on a pole and dry them out back then. And then they start uh, trying to get the peanuts still in the shell. They run through here with the vines and the nuts. The vines come out the back and the nuts came out to the side here. And they would take them to the uh, peanut like Tom's in Columbus and sell the peanuts. My granddaddy grew peanuts and we put them in croaker sacks, but later on they put them in trucks and take them. Now they put them in, they got peanut pickers and they take them to a peanut warehouse and dry them and then they shell them and they make all your Reese's and everything else. The first man to work with peanuts lived over in Tuskegee, Alabama. His name was George Washington Carver. He worked with sweet potatoes and peanuts, but he didn't make peanut butter, I'm gonna tell you that, some Frenchman. But uh, peanuts are important in Georgia. We grow about 800,000 acres of peanuts here in Georgia. So they are important and the farmers get, uh, uh, they sell them by the ton. A farmer can grow about a ton, 2,000 pounds. He can grow 3,000, and sometimes 4,000 pounds, two tons per acre. So he can make uh, he can make five, six hundred dollars from his peanuts. So peanuts are important. A lot of people grow peanuts in Georgia. Remember George Washington Carver. This looks like a barrel with a top cut out of it. You're right. Uh, this is uh, farmers. Uh, they they use the uh, the knowledge to do. Things. They'd take a pine tree and take the bark off, uh, like a fence post, stick it down there, or boards or whatever. Had creosote in there. They would uh, let it stay in there a week or two. And you creosote your post. You creosote your post. And up at Newland, Georgia, I remember going by the prisoner camp there, and the farmers bring the wood in there, they would skin them and uh, make, make fence posts for the farmers. The old, uh, the old uh, uh, county, county farm. County farm. Right. And they didn't charge them anything. Yeah. And that was a service to the farmer. So right. uh, I've seen them do this. Uh, it's a good way of uh, uh, treating fence posts and lumber, uh, whatever. Well, your fence post wouldn't last a year if you didn't treat mm -hmm. it with creosote. That's right. Let so. them dry out and treat it with creosote. So that was a good way. But, That's interesting. Just throw yeah. them in there. Now, how long would they have to sit in the creosote? Uh, I would say at least some left out four or five weeks. 
Just four or five weeks. Yeah, that almost soak it good. Well, you couldn't, now, you couldn't it, do many. No, you couldn't do many. You could fill it on up about eight to ten. But uh, some left that two weeks. Yeah. So uh, that was a good way of doing it. This came from a farmer up in Caddy uh, uh, County. Yeah. Interesting. Your daddy might use that. I don't he know. may have. <laughs> All right, what is this? This here is a potato planter, Irish potatoes. Oh, yeah, Irish, Irish potatoes. You can go to the store and buy Irish potatoes and uh, come back here and cut them up. Well, you want to make sure a potato has an eye on it. Right. So uh, somebody will sit back here and drop in here, drop maybe six to eight inches, and then you come back in 110 days and uh, 115, dig them up. Right. And you'd have Irish potatoes. So you can plant your Irish potatoes. The kids love this. Uh, they sit on in and say, we're going to make some french fries, potato chips, and uh, <laughs> potato salad and all that. So they love this thing. Right. This is called a potato planter. Y'all don't remember the old saying, one potato, two potato, three potato, four, five potato, six potato, seven potato, more. Yep. You can make a lot of potatoes. Yep. You like potatoes, don't you? Oh, yeah. But uh, this is an old uh, sickle mower, hard horse-drawn sickle mower with a with an extremely lar uh, long tongue on it for two, some reason. Two horses, two mules. Uh -huh. Two mules, and that was a four foot cut. Right. Another sickle mower. Sickle mower. You got a double mold board plow. Double mold board Pull plow. Pull tight. Right. And uh, then we got some walking plows. And walking plows. plows and sitting plows and turn plows. And, and that's, <laughs> that's another uh, mold board plow, but it's slated for, for, for uh, uh, wet dirt. Wet dirt. They let the dirt slide through, and they use a lot of these uh, where they have the bottom lands or somewhere like that to turn the dirt up dry out. Right. They make the hair it up. We talked about the uh, hairs, and we got some hairs up here. And uh, these also uh, display. That's another harrow. Right. And this is a, a, disc. a turning disc. It's got a disc. And regular hairs. These are all anywhere from 1900 to 1930s. Right, they? right, uh -huh. right. They really. That's what we had on our farm. Small stuff like this. Yep. This is a unique uh, piece of equipment here. Right. It's called a hillside flip plow, right. a disc plow. And what the farmers do, we plow our fields in a big circle, but here they go down and turn it and come back. It's on the hillside. It's like a mold board. Like a mold board. But what you did, this thing here would come up, if you'll pull that around. Right. And it, it would turn that Oh, it disc. turned the whole disc. Yes, the whole disc. So you don't have to, the horses didn't have to make a complete right. circle. Right. You know, they just made a half turn. That's it. And then, but you want to. But I could, I could see that that could be quite dangerous yeah. for the person sitting on it. Well, a man came in there one day, said he was up on one of these, his neighbor, and they started turning around, and the horses took off. When they did, the whole thing just flipped over and killed him. It killed him. Yeah. yeah, so you better be careful on this. But they could plow down, turn it around, come back, and turn around. A lot, lot of our fields are big enough they could make a circle. But it's an ingenious idea because it saves, uh, you know, hours, hours. of right. plowing time. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Call a hillside flip plow. And this would be good also for terracing. Yeah. You know, for, for erosion control. Right. That, yeah. that's, that's correct. And a lot of these discs in here, a lot of the farmers had them and they used them. Oh yeah, everybody uses the, the discs. Disc. But these are, like I said, everything here that we just walked through is from the turn of the century up till about 1936. Right. Something like that. They were right. riding plows, uh, they were walking plows, mm -hmm. they were uh, handheld plows. So all of them were pulled by mules mostly and then later right. on the tractors came in. Right. That helped out a lot. All right. All right, Mr. Bullock, what is this? This is a sprayer. Uh, had a pump. Right. And a motor. They could pull, pull it through the fields. This is an old one here. I yeah, especially if it had to have a motor running, because usually right. they're PTO driven. Right. Old uh, flywheel here. Made out of cypress wood. Cypress. Put, put the chemicals in here, spray the pecans, the peaches, the apples, and uh, then they made metal ones later. I got two wooden ones on the cypress. So this was made for spraying upwards for right, trees. Right, right. They'd go up and spray all the uh, the crops. And every farm had one that had uh, apples, peaches, 
um, blueberries, uh, pecans. So uh, that, that was really important. Then they quit making these, make stainless steels now. Right. But they use uh, PTO driven. Right. So they, and a lot of them pulling on trucks now too. They have a truck. And I have a pecan grower there. So it doesn't stuff. look like it would hold liquid right now. It wouldn't hold much sound, but one time it did. Yeah. It looks like another sprayer there, another irrigator there. That's another sprayer here. Okay, um, here in Woodland, they had a Georgia cushion and wrapper cutting. And Mr. Woodall came out of Georgia Tech, and he had all this timber and wood. They were cutting uh, timber uh, uh, boards, two by fours, two by sixes. But he, he said we could use this. He made a machine that would shred this uh, excelsior. They call it excelsior a wood wool. And uh, nest pads, uh, they use them softballs, oil filters, uh, and they use them in a lot of, uh, uh, out west they use a lot of it in the cooling pads and nest pads. But uh, what he used it for was put on peaches. They had a cushion here and a cushion here, and they put the excelsior in between. They could buy this excelsior, uh, you could buy it for 10 cents a pound. They used it in, um, in caskets too, to put in the bottom of the casket. They still use it. You can lay a body in there, and if you want the chest to stand up a little higher, you could put a little more excelsior, because it was cheap. Polyurethane came on the 50s, 60s, and they put him out of business, and uh, they still make nest pads, and uh, these chicken houses, they run water down through and cool the birds down. So they'll still use a lot, but uh, out west, in swamp pools on the houses, the humidity, they don't use air conditions. They run water down and through the excelsior. But uh, so when you die, you might be laying on the excelsior. <laughs> and if you want your chest to be a little higher, they'll stuff some more under there because it's a cheap material. And uh, so uh, pick your caskets out, ask them. Have they got excelsior in it, a wood wool, and you'd be the talk of the town because you'd have your chest sitting up and you'd be sitting up there and everybody'd say, oh man, that man looks good. So excelsior is something we use. <laughs> <laughs>
This is a cooler, you know, you put your 10 gallon cans in here and you just lift this and uh, put them down there. Now it was hard picking them up and putting them in there, but it kept the milk cool until you bottle it or whatever you did with it. Uh, they had the bottles there, glass bottles, and uh, we let our milk uh, sit over the side with a little like jello and we could make, churn it with some churns and we could make buttermilk and butter. So that was really important to the dairy farmers too, uh, that had dairies and the ones that didn't have dairies. So that was real important. Uh, this is our poultry section, and uh, they raise them in cages like this, the eggs come down. Uh, first they had to gather the eggs and they weighed them here for whatever size of. When you go in the store, they want to know if uh, it's a large egg, medium, or small by weight. But then they had a machine here would would do this small, medium, large, extra large. Uh, we know 12 eggs usually comes in a carton like this. They could be brown eggs or white eggs. Now, the conception is a brown chicken eggs, brown egg, and a white chicken eggs, white egg. That's not true. We got some chicken laid green eggs and other colors too, but uh, usually you buy them 12 in a carton. A baker dozen is uh, 13. But uh, I tell the kids that, uh, you know, uh, they can uh, sex a chicken by the uh, feathers on the wings. If they even across them, that's a male bird. If they uneven, it's a female. So at the hatchery, they say male and female. The males grow off a little bit faster than females. When a chicken molts, she says she's uh, a year old uh, or maybe over a year, and they, they quit laying eggs. You can take your chickens to molt them, cut all the lights off in the hen house, give them plenty of water and feed in about four to five weeks you know, cut the lights on, they start laying eggs. They need 10 to 11 hours a day of light. It could be a small bub, anything, but they, when they start laying eggs, they go, bah, bah, bah. a bear hibernates, but the chicken molts, grows new feathers, and she can build herself up. A chicken lays one egg a day. It takes 24 hours after she eats. Uh, it's an infidibulum in there, the follicles or the yolk, they pull it down. Sometimes they pull two yolks down. You know what that's called. It's not called twins. It's called what? Double yolk. Double yolk egg. All right, sometimes you crack open every two yolks. You get twice the money. But uh, as it takes 24 hours for that, it uh, takes 22 hours to put that shell around it. So you've got to have a lot of calcium. Use the oyster shells or something like that the chicken eats, and she can make a, a egg, okay? Mr. Bullock, it's been an adventure uh, today, and I've really enjoyed it. I thoroughly have. Now, I know we haven't seen but about half of what you've got. There's another whole building and another. I've got uh, peach packing sheds. i got cotton gins across the road. I've got uh, stuff for sy syrup making. We don't syrup over there. It's hard to find anybody to make syrup anymore, but we got a lot of things over there. A uh, milk, uh, another milk part. I love dairies and milk. Right. Yeah, right. No. We and, we both grew up on a dairy farm. Yeah. But I mean, we've seen an extensive amount today. We've traveled through all your your buildings here on this property today, yeah. right. and uh, maybe we can come back uh, next year and do another sure. series of your other buildings. Right. Um, but uh, your Museum and Ag Learning Center. It's not open full time, is it? Well, people call me, and I tell them to give me a call, and I try to come down here. I come for church groups, uh, just uh, people out of uh, nursing homes. I like to come here, and then uh, we get a lot of uh, school kids. But we we uh, we tell them uh, give us a call. We'll set an appointment up, and uh, so it's just by open by appointment. Only. Yeah, I, I'm don't, I'm not down here. I'm 75 years old, right, and. Uh, I've got some people to help me, but uh, they're doing other things too. We are we always doing something. The only event you have is one time a year. I have in, one time a year in February. Yeah, I used to have a farm camp here. You come on Friday, stay to Sunday, <laughs> and we kill chickens, castrate pigs, and, and uh, one I had it in the field, we had a tractor pull. Right. And we had uh, they were hay baling and log pulling and plowing mules and and uh, our big thing was up there was. We'd have 200 people out there watching me castrate pigs. That's hard to believe you get that many people. Right. We would have silage machines working. We would do a lot of stuff. Had one man killing uh, um, rabbits. 
and show them how to skin a rabbit and all that. <laughs> then I got a lot of slack off of that, so I quit that. And uh, <coughs> but uh, but I think the thing I, I wanted to do was have people come in and have an experience for three days, and we had people uh, with uh, honeybees. You know, I had honeybees down there one time, and we we make our own honey and stuff like that. Right. And uh, but the bees got out, started stinging them, so I, oh, I wow. had to quit that. So, but uh, I think the castrating was. I've been doing that all my life, and uh, and you know the, the goats, the sheep, the pigs, the cows, uh, uh, the sheep. Uh, they they enjoyed the sheep. We sheared sheep for them. Show them how to shear sheep. We had some kids out of Newland mm -hmm. to come down and shear for us. So we had a blacksmith shop. Well, people can find you on the internet. Oh yeah, if you, you go to oldsafarm.com, uh, we on there, and you okay. can pull us up. Phone number, address. We'll, we'll email, all that's on there. And uh, I, I'd uh, have people coming for the hog killing from everywhere. Right. Uh, we've had them from London, England to come by here. I think they're coming through Atlanta. Right. But they saw it. Um, this last year, we had them from Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Kentucky, right. and on up into Tennessee and Florida. Yeah. That's nice. Well, I appreciate you letting us uh, into see all of this today it's been a rare and beautiful treat simply because there's a lot of things that you can't that you can find to look at here that you it's even hard to find on the internet and some of these things are rare and the things even if they're not rare they're an antiquity of a bygone age and you're preserving that and to me i think that's a wonderful thing that there is people like you out there that preserves agricultural history. Because too many people these days, they don't care about agriculture. Even if you go out into the Midwest where agriculture is rampant, they don't really care about the antiquity of it. No. It's all modernized and electronic and with, done with cellular telephones. And they got tractors now that uh, drive themselves, you know. It's, uh, that's kind of hard to believe. Satellite right. up there telling the tractor what to do. Right. But you know, um, we're one of the best kept secrets in Georgia. And, uh, and that's why I wanted to feature you on America Unveiled. Okay, well, we appreciate it. And uh, we appreciate uh, the people today. And I know a lot of them out here uh, haven't seen this. Give me a call and uh, we'll open the museum up and uh, have a good time and uh, we'll reminisce about that by, bygone days. Well, Mr. Bullock, until uh, next year when we come to do a part two uh, of all your rest of uh -huh. your uh, museum yeah. uh, and your other location across the street, right. uh, until then, thank you very much. You're welcome. And uh, Glad to have you. Talk thank you all for coming. Right. And this wraps up this episode of America Unveiled. We have been at the Old South Farm Museum in Woodland, Georgia with Mr. Paul Bullock. Until next time, see you later.